out all your <laughs> Muting my mic is always a wonderful thing. Hello, everyone, and welcome here to Town Hall Heroes, episode number 119. My name is Hollow Jake. This week, we've got Dunk Train, KO, and the illustrious Wolf joining us for the very first time. We're going to be talking about the PTR, taking a dive into the realm of Korea, something we don't talk about as much as we should, honestly. Uh, Blood Loss giving you guys the updates regarding that, and then all your esports with a lot of the preview going on for PAX. Uh, but before we get into all of our topics, Dunkus, how is the Legion grind? Oh, man, it's grindy. So um, I told you this actually before the show, but basically I pre-packed all of my packs stuff yesterday. So, so like I just took a nap and then logged on Legion at midnight, grinded it out. I'm only 107 right now. Only. Not quite to 110 because <laughs> I haven't been that efficient, but we'll get there. I'm not even 102 yet, Dunk. Casual. Same. KO, have you been playing WoW? Well? I just started playing today. Like, I was busy with the stream on PTR and everything all last night. So, while everybody was getting on it, you know, right when the servers went live, I'm just like, you know what? I'm here for you to watch HOTS while you grind out the new quests. You know, I'm going to be the, the champion of the people here. So, but now I've gotten started with it and uh, playing my warrior, having a good time getting the artifact weapon. So, yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it. Just taking it a little bit more slow though. But while you guys are all, you know, hanging out at PAX, of course, I'm not going to be at this event, but I'll be able to play a little bit more WoW. So, wait, you don't hidden even, uh, plus side there. You don't even have your artifact weapon. No, Jake, I just started. Oh, okay, oh, man. <laughs> Anyways, <Wow. laughs> Wolf, what level are you in WoW? Uh, I never played WoW before. Sorry, like uh, when I when I like see the W, like the Warcraft icon in uh, Heroes of the Storm, I'm like oh, these are just Heroes of the Storm characters, right? Like I don't know about that World of Warcraft <laughs> game. I never played Warcraft really either. I'm just, I just know, like I'm like Jaina, yeah, she was in Hearthstone, right? Um, so <laughs> I've never actually played that game before, so I feel a little bit left out. Maybe this is the place to start. I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Oh, save man. your soul. Save your soul. And uh, yeah, don't fall in. It's a, it's a deep hole. It really is. Well, guys, we've got a lot to talk about. We're going to be opening up with the PTR discussion. I, in WoW, I've, I, I'm have i almost 102. That's pretty cool. It seems pretty fun. So props to the WoW team on all their good efforts. And uh, shout-outs to Holinka. I know he watches the show and he works on that team. So, oh, you got your personal <laughs> shout-out, buddy. Uh, well, anyways, we're going to be focusing a lot on Heroes. PTR did go live this week, and guess what? There's a lot of changes in it. This is a PTR that brings not only a new hero, Alarak, but it also brings uh, the first of the StarCraft maps and the whole StarCraft event, which includes um, basically daily quests. I mean, if you were around when they did the, the, the invasion for Diablo 3, I can't remember what it's called. Um, was it just called the Demonic Invasion? No, mm -hmm. no, that's an ability. It was called something else. Do you guys remember? I'm trying to remember right now. I'm trying Still to recall. And now I, I can only think was called. It, it, I can only think of Machines of War, of course. Now yeah. it's just like implanted in my brain. Somebody, somebody in chat will, somebody will get be it. spamming in caps. Eternal in a conflict. Eternal there conflict. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Good That's work. Right. Okay. And uh, that was great. Like there was this cool like daily quest where you could log in and get you know it was like an incentive and it was thematic and there were two maps and there were all these special skins that came out and this yeah. is exactly that but for StarCraft. Uh, and of course, that is called Machines of War, but we finally have it on the PTR. So let us literally navigate to the patch notes. Boom, boom, and here we are. Now, we're not going to read through each and everything, but there are some rather compelling changes uh, that have been put into the PTR with this. So yes, we know we have Alarak, and you know, actually, who has actually had the time to play Alarak? I played him in try mode. I played a ton of Alarak. I played him in try mode also. That's that's all I did. I literally right before the show just to get the feel for how he feels. Mm -hmm. I like his push uh, ability. It's it's pretty fun. I I mean I only did it versus the Arthas bot, but I think in practice <laughs> could be really exciting. <laughs> uh, 
It's, I agree. I think it's. Oh, sweet. I did it against real Arthas players, and I can confirm it is very fun. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the very first draw mechanic added into Heroes, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. where basically draw three cards. You, <laughs> you, you draw a line in order to you know, push your, your opponent or yourself, and it does do a bit of damage. Um, so he's, he's really you know, like a, a rather unique melee assassin. Uh, Ko, since you said you've played a lot of them, what are your first impressions? Well, my stream had a really good time watching me because... I went into Alaric, Alaric not really like, by the way, the pronunciation, it's Alaric, Alaric right? Alaric. Alaric? I believe so. Oh, my Alaric, goodness. Alaric, okay. maybe? Alaric? This is, this is a hot topic of debate right now because a lot of people are getting tilted by the pronunciations and stuff, but <laughs> I'll just call him Alaric because, you know, I trust you, Jake. But, so when I started playing this character, um, of course, I play with quick cast on everything right now, mm-hmm. and when I started playing this character... Uh, this ability is really confusing when you start playing it with quick cast on <laughs> and just because of the way it like targets and like, you know, the way it like spawns and moves like I was just dragging. I made so many mistakes for like the first two games and I just made an idiot out of myself on stream trying to get used to this ability. But finally, I feel like I'm comfortable using it even on quick cast now, although I highly recommend that if you're a quick cast player. Just go ahead and start with quick cast off on this ability. It is way too annoying to like get it right every time. It's so much easier if you just see exactly what you're doing. So, um, yeah, the ability's really cool though, and I feel like it's it's going to be one of those high skill cap abilities to like control in fights and like very quickly like drag somebody in or push yourself away at the right time. And it's not as simple as just like clicking on somebody like most abilities are. The fact that you do have to draw, it's it adds that extra layer of complexity to like a very quick time event, but you actually have like two actions that you have to do. So it's tricky to use. I feel like it's going to be just high mechanical skill cap character in general. I'm sure if any of you guys have played Alaric, you've already realized this. It's an extremely difficult character, kind of like how Dahaka is very difficult as a tank and a lot of people shy away from him because it really falls onto you to hit the tongue, right, when you're playing Dahaka. And just like with that, if you go in as Alaric and you just mess up and kind of like whiff your stuff and you you don't get value out of your pull combo, you're just, you look like an idiot because you just walked in and you're just dead. You have no defensives, panic buttons, or mobility to escape. So you're very like committed to the fight once you go in. Um, but I've got to say, he does a lot of damage. It does do a lot of damage. Um, like just in general, like his kit, the the whole his trait. What is it called? Sadism or is it sadism? Let's let's all butcher sadism. 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 Yes, yeah. first attempt. Um, so, but you can you can basically sacrifice. There's a lot of talents that you sacrifice damage or you sacrifice uh, x y. You basically sacrifice part of this meter in order to gain functionality. So additional push on his W or maybe additional healing from his E. I, I don't remember all of them exactly just because I've only read through his talents once or twice. But um, that's kind of a cool thing. It's a unique thing to his hero where his trait actually gets weakened based on some of these talents. And it's kind of like a trade-off. How, I mean, Dunk, how do you feel about that as like just his overall design? I actually really like that design. I think it's interesting in that it allows him to have a lot of AoE abilities without having good wave clear which is something we haven't seen before. One of the downsides of a lot of the mages is like they incidentally get insane AOE wave clear, like Kael'thas or Jaina. Like, it's okay for those heroes to have wave clear, but it wasn't intentional. And this is a hero who intentionally doesn't have the wave clear that his kit would otherwise have, which I think is very interesting. Plus the opportunity to get those trade-offs in the talents to trade utility for damage directly is, I think, really fun and cool. I, I, I'm excited for him, like, once he hits 10, like, if you hit 10 with him, I feel like he becomes, like, a pretty cool ganker if you are able to hide, like, your rotation with them because you can dash in and then silence somebody, and then if you have someone paired with that, then you can get a kill, so I think it's pretty exciting. Not a super long cooldown on it, I think it's 60 seconds on his dash. 45, probably I believe, knows actually. Yeah, 45. Oh, so even shorter, so nice. So, yeah, I think... And then 30 seconds on his other ultimate, so that's extremely short. But the other ultimate is uh, feels very underwhelming, Oh, oh, just oh, from first counter? impressions? Yeah, like, it does barely n- any damage at all, but I can see it being used as, like, something that ends up being, like, popular and competitive just because it counters, like, a certain spell or timing. And it's just, like, it's one of those things, though, where if you're just kind of throwing it out there, you feel a lot of times like you just didn't get anything out of the out of the ability. So, like, charge seems far superior to me on first impressions. But 
um, the first thing I saw when I looked at the other alt, the Counter Strike one, as I'm like, hey, that's a 30 second cooldown. That's pretty insane. So like you, you kind of want to use it as a defensive if you're going to go that ultimate because you don't have any other panic buttons or ways to survive in a team fight. So it buys you that like second of stasis. Hmm. Um, but on the other hand, the other ultimate is only a 45 second cooldown as well. So you have a lot of mobility through your ultimate with this character um, once you hit that. And like you don't, you're not one of those characters that. Your team is waiting for like the major cooldown, like Mosh Pit or something, where it's like, oh wait, guys, you know, I get I twenty more seconds for my ult to cool, come up. You always have it for ganks and stuff, which is pretty cool. He seems like, yeah, I think, like just for ganking in general, it just seems like having that mobility with the charge to go through walls, though. Like just comparing yeah. it to Counter Strike, that gives him so many options. Like he can be there. Like you think the rotation's coming, if you don't report that rotation immediately, he's in your lane, he's killing you, you're out of position, you're dead. Yeah, it's also interesting the more diversity we see in heroic cooldowns, like with having more heroes that have really short cooldowns, you can get compositions that every single hero on your team has like a 45 second, 60 second cooldown heroic. And then you can kind of outmaneuver the longer cooldown heroics that way, which is something that we've seen a little bit of, but not that much. And I think we're going to start seeing more of that, like people playing around Mosh by forcing a team fight while it's down because they picked five 50 second, 60 second CD heroics. Yeah, I think it comes at like a really interesting time too because uh, Blizzard reducing the mount speed for everybody and all the mobility for a lot of heroes. So him being able to dash in like that is super important right now. I think for kind of where we're we're going forward into this patch, I guess we're going to talk about this change a little bit uh, later. But I think that it gives them a little bit more mobility in a time where I think everyone in general is going to be able to roam a little bit less than they used to in the past. Yeah, yeah. it's a good point. And uh, so far, like from what I've seen. There's two major play styles with uh, Alaric, and one of them is more of a tank shredder, where you're focused more on just kind of shutting down the tanks where they can't use any defensives to get out. Because when you silence somebody with that, it puts a tank in a really awkward position where you normally, like against Muradins and Uberx, all these characters that have some way to kind of pop a shield and get out, when you silence somebody, they're just stuck. And it can be really you know, scary for a tank player when you just shut them down and just use all your cooldowns on them right away and kind of get that, like, fast target swap burst onto a tank. And so I really think that's pretty cool. And uh, the other style, of course, is I, I feel like going more of, honestly, a poke build with the the lightning talents because you can build into where you basically always have 100% sadism and you get a lot of talents that buff your lightning, your lightning surge talent to where you have a shorter cooldown, you do... Uh, more single target damage. You have a big slow on your lightning as well. I don't know if you guys saw, but there's a 75% slow for 1.5 seconds what? on the lightning. That talent is pretty crazy. Now it's only targets in between you and the in the actual uh, node that you're using the lightning on, so it has to hit somebody in between. But it's 75% for a second and a half, That's which really is cool. Ins- that is an I intense. I love it. Slow. So when when I've what I've really enjoyed the most on Alaric so far, just the most fun for me, has been to play this like lightning poke build. We're just constantly throwing out the lightning, like slowing people in team fights, just being that like wild card mage factor. And then you can really turn up a lot of burst when you want to like secure a kill almost like Greymane, go for the throat, where you charge your ultimate up and you just go in for somebody in the back line. I've had by the way, so with this build, you stay at 100% sadism. I, I mentioned that before. Right. But what that does is it makes your ultimate do like a huge amount of damage. That charge hits at full full value. So like I've had situations where you go in and I've taken out a tracer from like 30, 40% just when she doesn't expect it, um, just by dashing through in the middle of a fight. So that's pretty cool. Now, the one downside with the charge of course is that if you get any damage on you while you're charging it up it cancels right so you have to be a little bit like sneaky and calculated with how you use it i mean so many ranged assassins or so many melee assassins work that way you think of like kerrigan rotations and uh, oftentimes even thrall rotations you have to be a little bit on the uh jumping your opponent so it just makes perfect sense for that with a 45 second cooldown as well like plenty of opportunities to make those rotations happen uh that's cool though obviously i haven't had a whole lot of time to experiment with the builds but that's that sounds really good do you think that's going to be a common um way to play him or is the damage output like noticeably lower than if you were to go more of a you know in your face style for me personally right now i think the 
competitive style of play is going to focus more on building the discord strike the silence mm-hmm. and shredding helping like shred frontline by throwing the silence like on the tanks that move in i think especially right now with like the double tank meta where you have bruisers that feel like they kind of can safely just run all over your team having this person who can shut them down with the silence and leave them very vulnerable in the middle of your team is something that i think you can punish a lot more with alaric so i feel like more of the hybrid build um looking to increase the range on telekinesis to get those pickoffs and then pairing that with the improved discord uh, talents where you get the increased range and stuff on that. Cause that silence of course is going to be what's so key in competitive play. Yeah. It's going to be all about hitting the silence and the telekinesis. So it kind of works like Kerrigan right now where you pull them in kind of like the same way that primal grasp pulls them in and then instantly silence them. That's a lot of the way that I see this ability, this like combo playstyle being used, and then you kind of have the E to just finish targets off. But I mean, it's hard to say right now because let's be honest, like if you read through these talents, it's very hard to uh, theory craft. Like you have to like really think about your choices because this has one of the most complex talent trees I think we've ever seen in terms of decisions. Though a lot of the most complex options. And that's all just due to his trait, really. Like the the number of things mm-hmm. where it's like sacrifice damage to get this additional impact or, or X Y Z. There's so many situational things that could be really cool. Uh, that's cool to hear. That's 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 great. Um, okay, yeah, I like I like your opinion about just being able to silence those those frontliners, the tanks, and whatnot. Uh, just in terms of like matchups, thinking about like Leoric or Murd, and like you mentioned, trying to get that dwarf toss away, trying to get that wraith walk away. He sounds utterly terrifying for their existence. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Any final thoughts on uh, Alorak, Aloric, Leoric? I know. I, <laughs> I would just say that like, the, one of the coolest things is there's this town at 13. Uh, it's called Something of Malice, um, where you get an extra 10% sadism buff every time one of your allies dies. And the thing is, with this build, you stay at 100%. So with that talent, you have over 100%. So your <laughs> spells start doing so much damage when you get up to like 130% versus enemies. It's crazy. Yo, dude, so. pure malice plus murky. GG. Yeah, exactly. Just send them <laughs> in there. Just let them die. Vikings. Play against Jersey. Vikings just to like top off your stacks real quick. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, all right, I'm ready for the team fight. Oh, my God. That's gross. That's actually yeah. gross, but so cool. I'm super excited for just more melee assassins in the game in general. I mean, I just got like a melee mage, I guess, but him possibly blade master coming up later uh, and, and other melee assassins. I think it's, we have like a small pool of that right now. Everyone always talks about how we have a small support pool, but there's not that many melee assassins it's that true. are like competitive either. Yeah. So that's something else I'm, I'm excited to see. As soon as you say possibly uh, blade master, I just picture grubby somewhere bouncing with joy. Like, please. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be cool. Oh my gosh, once Blade Master's in the game, we're all just doomed. Groby's just going to join yeah, Dignitas. He's going to retire. Take over the world. Yep. <laughs> One last thing I just want to say about uh, Alaric. I think that I'm just speculating right now that I think he's a little bit lackluster for competitive level play, right? From my oh. first impression. I would say, like, overall, we've been talking about, you know, how many fun ways there are to play him and, like, all the cool stuff that he can do. But I don't know. Like, it just seems like you have no. It's so hard to, like, use any defensives once you get into a fight and you really rely on like the silence and the E while it's pretty good, it just doesn't feel that impactful most of the time. So, you know, I like the fact that you can like combo people, do all this damage, hit silences, but I'm a little bit uh, fearful of like him not performing as well as like Thrall and Sonya and stuff. So, I mean, we'll see. Have I want to be proven wrong. Have but you tried using I the think, telekinesis to like as an escape at all? Yeah. Or? I mean, yeah, you can do that. It's just like it's it's also hard to get in there and actually get silences on people because that is a pretty tough ability to hit. Yeah, it's to it's a very tight well. range, and like you have to talent into it if you're not going to use telekinesis to hit it has, targets. It has some wind up too, right? I mean, I mean, just oh, playing yeah. in try mode, like so oh, Q, you can yeah. dodge it pretty easily, and it goes in like a it like gets narrower as it goes in. So the further you are away, the easier it is to dodge. It's not yeah. a forgiving range either. You know how some abilities are like, he definitely was not in the circle, but I'll take it. it with this, if he's not, if they're not exactly <laughs> in the peak of that triangle, you don't get that. You don't get yeah. it. Like, they're, it's not a forgiving range. Mm-hmm. Well, fair enough. Should, should be cool to see where he goes. I'll rack on the PTR now if you guys want to try him out. 
uh, really cool hero. The other big addition to the PTR was the new Battleground Braxis Holdout. Uh, it's a two-lane map, the first two-lane map we've had in the game since, well, I guess, BOE. But uh, it's it's definitely... T I've only played it twice. They were very polarized games in terms of MMR. They were five stacks versus solo cures. <laughs> and I got completely rolled on this. So I have absolutely no... No real feel as to how the map plays out because it just felt like I was defending swarms of Zergs for days. Uh, have you, Ko? So, what are your thoughts on it? So I played like probably thirty games on this map Holy last night. Crap. The customs just Damn. bam, 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 just knocking them out, you know, one after another. So I played a ton, maybe not thirty. Okay, that's that's a little bit <laughs> hyperbolic, but okay. Listen, I played a lot of games. I think it was you know somewhere up there and. I have to say, it. I hate to say it, guys, but it feels a little like mines, where the objective is a little bit too strong right now. Hmm. Just in my first impression, like, those are, it's crazy. By the way, it's a very cool feeling to see them all rush out, because it's not like it's just one big grave golem. You know, it's like you've got the Zerglings leading the charge, and then the Ultralisks come in behind them, and then you've got the, like, artillery whatever they're called, things like flying in the background, you know, bombarding people. So it is really cool, but I think those Zerg, the Zerg Swarm right now is extremely strong um, compared to something like on the battlefield maps when you get a first Immortal. You Oof. know, usually you're going to get a front wall. Maybe if you have a Sylvanas on your team, you can start threatening the fort. No, you're almost guaranteed to get a fort if you have like more than 50%. It's crazy. That is crazy. So I'm glad I'm not alone in feeling like, whoa, these swarms are nuts. Like, if you get a, yeah. a, a advantageous swarm, like that first one's bigger. I remember the first one, we had three Zerglings, and they had, like, the whole, like, <laughs> hive mind just coming at me. Yeah. Like, I was like, this, my three lings, they, they absorbed, like, six shots. That's all they did. And, well, my team anything. just got rolled, but... So the, is the map like I, I've I watched like some of the streams at, at Gamescom and stuff, and obviously I saw like the, the intro video and things like that. When the swarm comes, are all the units like different? Like, do you have like there's like some zerglings and some hydras and like a guardian and like a broodlord or something? So like, is targeting them actually like beneficial to to like you know stopping the push? Do you want to like target down the big units at the back, or does it really matter? Or just curious about that. It's usually the fact where you're just trying to kill what's in front of you. You're just trying to take out the melee first, but it balances it out pretty well to where there's like a mix of melee and ranged. Um, I haven't really experimented with just trying to like snipe out the damage damagers in the back line. That's a good idea. I like that. Yeah, but I, I think that is the case because honestly, the brood wars, the brood lords seem to, to do a lot of damage. Like there's there's like we have like three of them and they were the only things left. And my structures are still just like getting wrecked. Um, but I mean, honestly, that was after just a couple games. But what what do you think about the Merc camps and like the way that they're so they, strong? They interact. Yeah, they seem strong. I think this map is extremely important. It's a, it's very important to have a good jungler on this map and to get those camps constantly. From what I've seen, they put out an immense amount of pressure. It's kind of like the uh, shamans with the dogs, mm -hmm. how much they can get on their own. It's very similar. By the way, the Raven is so cool. It shoots out the little seeker missile that like hunts you down just like in Starcraft where it like locks on at the last second and you're like, no, you're dead. It's very cool. It's, it's but, funny. Cause like every time I see an ally soloing the camp and I see that missile go out, I'm like, run dude, run, you're going to die. But the damage is nowhere near what it is like <laughs> yeah, in, in yeah, Star 2. the same level of impact you'd see then. But uh, at one point in one of the games, so the first shrine the first phase, I should say, for the beacons. We're going to call them the beacons. I'm trying to try not to mix it up here and call them seeds and trines like everyone does. <laughs> I'm going to try to call it the beacons, okay? On the first phase of beacons when we were playing, I had gone and taken a the night camp where you have the, the whole little uh, Terran squad with the raven. Um, and they pushed. The st they started pushing. And meanwhile, this one thing about this map is that you can kind of control the objective for a very long time, unlike mines, where you can just like kind of snipe it and finish it. On this map, the fact that you have to actually control both beacons means that you can make the game last a very long time before mm -hmm. you even get one of these beacons completed. But during this first beacon phase, my night camp pushed all the way through a fort and the keep. It was insane. What? It pushed that hard. Yeah. Mm. That's the four pack with the raven. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, we were, we were also pushing the wave like more aggressively. 
but not to the point where we were pushing with it the whole time. It was doing most of the work on its own. And that kind of blew my mind. Those camps are nothing to play around with. Is that just because the Raven summon turrets tank tower shots and stuff? Yeah, I think so. And like just the, those front line, the front line units, like the night melees, mm-hmm. they, they absorb so much damage. Interesting. So, so by the way, like this map is or, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, do you guys know the catapults are actually siege tanks? No, they're not siege tanks. They're um, the, the, the other ones, the cars with, I, I can't remember what they're called, but they're not siege tanks. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, are they're, they're not like hellbats or something. No, no, they're not hellbats. Hellbats are one of the merc camps. Um, the they drive really fast in Star Two. It's a Terran unit. Cyclone. I think they're cyclones. Yeah. Okay, I actually don't have a bit able to play the map yet, sadly. So, like, I mean, I I've watched people play it on streams and stuff, but that's <laughs> that's yeah, all I've no. seen. But like, I I saw them. I was like, yo, my team's dead. Those things are so scary. Or <laughs> just. Yeah. So I was I was gonna ask like, do you feel like the map is like super snowball-y because of all the the stuff you were describing? Like the uh, objectives really powerful. The merc camps are powerful. So if you like get a few kills, you just kind of control the map and 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 run train. Or is it like much? You think there's, there's comeback potential? I'm just asking you because you played a lot. Yeah, it actually um, does feel snowball-y to me, and that's that's kind of what I was alluding to mm-hmm. earlier. It's just it it feels a little haunted mindsy where it's like. People are going to dislike this map because of how snowball it feels. The one thing that I think will kind of save it in that regard, though, is the fact that you can really control this first objective for a long time. So even if you get, like, wiped a little bit and you lose a bunch of people and they get, like, 60%, 70% of the thing capped, as long as you regain control of one half of the map, like, you just commit more resources to that half of the map. And if you can control that, then you, you can just base trade the whole time. It's kind of like capping DK is how it's a lot more challenging to actually get the DK and yeah. for example, just finish off like uh, an immortal on battlefield, so you can control the map a lot longer and delay the objective spawning. So, in that regard, I feel like there's a little bit of a way to delay, you know, this huge push that's going to be coming at you. But I can't help but feel like the map does does seem pretty snowbally to me overall. All right, are you ready for the crazy question, Ko? Hmm. Is this Gazlo's time? It might be. This map is so good for Gazlo. That's true. Don't get so Just build mad. a village on one of the beacons, get your village up and running, and now, of course, with that level four talent, the lane is right there. So you just walk like five feet, and you auto attack minions, and you get and the infinite. Other, the other raking. thing about Gazlo that I thought of when I was playing it is like, okay, well, you get these big swarms of minions that the enemy team desperately wants to clear. Perfect time to gravo bomb them. It's zone control. <laughs> no matter how you look at, even if you hit nothing, it's still zone control. But <laughs> that's that's uh, that's that's a good point too, Jake. Yes. <laughs> Dunk doesn't seem as enthusiastic about this idea. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the zoning gravel bombs, man. That's, that's the strat, zoning man. gravel bombs, right. boys. Welcome to the future. I hope you're ready. <laughs> also, so, the boss on this map. I don't know what to think about it. It feels like it's pretty low impact and it's easy to take. Um, because it doesn't have strong abilities. It just has this like one ability where it shoots a machine gun in a very narrow line. So it's easy to just move out of that. And it doesn't seem like it wrecks that much. It just kind of, it's like, ow, that hurts. So, okay, okay, I'm good. But it, it's not like, there's no zoning mechanic where there isn't like a stun you have to run away from or tornadoes pushing you around and like ruining your positioning. So this this boss feels a lot more like an, a much more neutral sort of thing to brawl around rather than this big throw pit. That's cool. I mean, I, I <laughs> like that. I, it, I like having a uh, variety in the bosses. Is it, does it hit hard though? I've, I haven't attempted to take it myself. It yet. seems like, it seems like it doesn't hit that hard. I think it's uh, correct me if I'm wrong guys, but it, somebody was saying last night too, that it's one of those, it's one of the bosses that like focuses players. Is that, I don't know. I like, I, I should once it's this, already capped. Is what you're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like that's a what sure where it'll like actually attack you instead of yeah. attacking the structures. Yeah, I think it might prioritize players over structures, so it's one of those bosses you have to actually push with hmm. to get value out of it. It's a Viking, but, right? Yes. Well, it's I don't know if it's like it's like a weird hybrid mech yeah. monstrosity, but um, one thing that's crazy by the way is you can just cap the boss with your uh, Zerg rush. 
It's like which that. side does the boss go to? He goes to the side with your Zerg Rush or against theirs, or does it like alternate or something? I think it goes to the side with yours. Okay, that's insane. Like the push potential there seems insanity. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Like if you control a game, I mean, like all of us cast yours now, right? Like you, you, anyone ever cast a game where like someone's up like three levels or two levels even, and they get like two kills, and it's like. What are you going to do? You know, you control the game, you control the camps, you get the boss, and you have the, the Zerg wave pushing, and then you just, you can't lose, basically. So that's kind of, like, my concern just from hearing what K.O. said about, like, his thoughts on the map so far. Like, it feels like it could be, like, one of those Sky Temple-type maps where if you get ahead, you just kind of don't lose unless you really screw up. So I yeah. guess like, that's my concern just from hearing all of this so far. One thing that's an interesting interaction, I, I agree with you on that. I mean, that's that's my biggest concern, too, from playing it. But like when you cap Merc camps and they like crash with the Zerg swarm, that that's pretty cool to see. Just like that interaction of like Mercs yeah. just battling it out versus the Zerg swarm and Terran seeing like what Zerg. matchup. It's it's really yeah exactly cool. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean I, I mean think... I don't think anyone's gonna say that it didn't hit it out of the park thematically. Like oh, yeah. it looks amazing. All the Mercs are sweet. I think it's really really cool adaptation of Starcraft into the Heroes engine. I think it's more of like a game mechanics, like is this going to be a good map for competitive and or hero league than like people being concerned about what it looks like. Cause I think it's, everyone agrees it looks amazing. The StarCraft community is like super happy with it. They have like tributes to a lot of fun, uh, famous pro gamers in it as well. And uh, oh, really? people are super happy. Yeah, there's like a Flash tribute, an ST tribute, I think, a Boxer tribute. Like some of the people like in the background, like in the doodads are like on like, uh, you know, um, controlling the <laughs> web, like have like jerseys on and stuff i don't really know so exactly cool. it's not last night that's so, amazing on the, wow. on the right the right side base is flash he's piloting your core so flash is a mm-hmm. legendary starcraft pro gamer also legendary boxer he's on the left side he's piloting that core oh my gosh that's amazing that is so awesome where you control the actual zerg on the map you've got yellow and nesty and it's just, it's one of the coolest things. Like, obviously, there's a big history with, with pro gaming and StarCraft, but to, like, bring that into the game, super satisfying. And you guys could hear the map right now. I just wanted to, like, let you guys hear that StarCraft music ramping up, that Terran music just kind of going in. And it's it's about as, as good as it gets. Like, I hit that, that mega nostalgia factor when I was playing it, just the music kicking in, and it feels like you're, it almost feels like playing like a mission in Star 2, except you're playing a MOBA, right? It's cool. Yeah. I think they really hit it out of the park for sure, and like, the StarCraft community is really hard to please, and they're usually like the community that be like, I don't know if this really feels like StarCraft, even though it's a different game, <laughs> but uh, they were happy with it, so I'm like, I think people will generally just really like it once it, once it comes out. What is the um, overall like perception with like between Star Two and uh, and Heroes in Korea? Is there like any crossover at all? Uh, I would say not, not so much. Like there is some with the uh, the fan base. Like I see a lot of people that go to both like Pro League um, and then also go to Heroes and also go to GSL. Um, you know, just like Korean fans, esports fans. There's a lot of esports fans in Korea that I swear these guys don't have jobs or anything. They're just literally at every event all the time. <laughs> wow. Um, and, uh, two of the casters, actually one of the three of them, when they, uh, before, uh, Ace, who is now known as Uther retired from casting because he moved into the military, like all the heroes casters for the Korean side are all like Starcraft casters slash players from brew war. Then like on the Korean side too, like Artosis and I are both Starcraft commentators. So in that, in that regard, there's like a huge crossover between Starcraft and heroes. Cool. Um, just like there's quite a few ex Starcraft casters in heroes as well. Like, you're kind of like an ex-Starcraft caster, Calaris, uh, Calder. So there's a uh, definitely a lot of crossover in that regard. Did um, you say I'm Korea. kind of like an ex-Starcraft caster. Yeah, aren't you like the? Well, I, I, mean, I, I was an admin. Like you, were, you were, you were, like a well, you were an you were like a Starcraft person in my yeah, mind. Okay. So I was a Starcraft person, but I wasn't a caster. But yeah, you know what? I'll take it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think there's. There's a crossover with the fans. Uh, obviously, TNL was like a four X StarCraft two pro gamers plus Jayhun. So uh, there's a lot of like people that I talk to in the Korean scene that are like, yeah, no, I used to play StarCraft two. I thought I was gonna be a pro gamer, but it didn't work out. So in, in Korea, it's like 
a lot of people think that switching games is super easy. So they're like, yeah, well, I was a StarCraft 2 pro gamer. It didn't work out. So I became a Heroes pro gamer. Now that's not working out. So I'm just just, just going to be an Overwatch pro gamer. I'm like, uh, these <laughs> games are all very different from each other. So I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know work, if that's but... just Korea, man. I think a lot, there's a lot of that yeah. perception in today's yeah. like pro gaming environment. It's just like people have that tendency to think that like they can just switch it on and off, you know, to whatever game they want to play and like hop the learning curve. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that's that's an interesting topic. And I think it's a lot due to like the way that esports has evolved to where it's all this like jump on the new thing type type of uh, mentality to where you have a lot of that sort of like player hopping. But like nobody dares hop from like a newer game to like Dota or something. You know what I mean? Like nobody nobody hops like to the, the major like. Crazy One does games. not simply hop into Dota, okay? Yeah. No, that's <laughs> a yeah. Herculean mountain to climb, Guys. let alone hop. But Guys, yeah. I got I got six yes. circlings. Six circlings. What did my, my opponents get? Oh god. Oh, oh you're wrecked. Lord. That's GG. We need a tasteless GG button here. You're gonna get wrecked, brother. <laughs> it's cool too, on that like top and bottom of the map, you can see the little like incubation tank where you can see all your Zerg units like piling in. Yeah, my little my like, little yellow your, tank, my yellow Zerg player isn't really playing well enough. His APM's not what it used to be. It's like watching a play start too. Yeah. He's just terrible. And then you've got an <laughs> ST just like running train on my team right now. He takes my fort out like nothing. I'm just getting bodied in the back. Oh. Red team obviously never missed a single inject larva. I mean, they are on point <laughs> with their macro right now. Yeah, uh, it's not really fair to have Flash versus Boxer because Flash is just always <laughs> going to win that matchup, right? Like, <laughs> Flash is a much better player is in contemporary times. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's not even close. But Boxer's a cool guy, and I would want him on my team. Um, okay. The timing of this is cool with the whole, like, resurgence of brood war stuff coming back now that's true everybody like getting all amped up on that if, and if that's I, real we don't know it's real even though the korean sources say it's like 100 percent. wolf what do you think okay about that? so the korean source is actually like basically if you read it like I don't, I don't know where it was leaked into like the western community but if you read it in korean it's like basically clickbait it's like not even real it's like yeah well i mean rumor has it this new brood war could happen and everyone's excited about it is like basically the TLDR of the article. I'm like, everyone's like, see, it's leaked. There's proof. I'm like, no, that it's like just not true. Like it just doesn't really even confirm anything. But you just ruined um, my night wolf. But I mean, Brood War HD, like the concept obviously is exciting in Korea. And even if it doesn't happen, if it's all just a hoax and it's not real, uh, like it's the Brood War is coming back in Korea. Like I cast Starcraft One at Afrika uh, quite a bit and the crowds that we have there are bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, we just got announced that it's going to be with the GSL finals. Like it's going to happen right before the GSL finals. So I imagine the crowd is going to be massive. And if this does happen, like I imagine it's going to be out of this world sick and it's going to be like a new eSport basically it, coming out of Korea only. I don't know if uh, outside of Korea people will play it, but in Korea, it's going to be massive for sure, and there'll be like English commentary. I, I know you don't you don't live in America right now, but right now everything is like resurgence mode. Like melee has yeah. been on the rise. Melee is that exact you know example in esports, but like Stranger Things is really a uh, really popular Netflix series, which is all about like eighties culture. Like that's what is making everyone really happy right now. So I feel like making a retro Brood War, like a retro Warcraft, and re-releasing it would be the smartest thing ever from blizzard we'll see even if not it's still a hype time with starcraft like you yeah. just hear a lot of starcraft right now you know there's just a lot of buzz about it so i feel like the timing of the map is just so cool agreed agreed absolutely yeah well okay well we need to continue running down the list here on the ptr the map is really fun is it the new haunted mines that's to be determined but a lot of people seem to feel that way Obviously, it's in the PTR still. They can make adjustments. They can nerf it early game, so on and so forth. There's a lot of things they can do. But I like the the uh, the power of the Merc camps. They really do feel uh, like you can't leave them alone. As we mentioned, there's all these great daily quests and stuff. But one thing we haven't talked about is the new MVP, play, MVP system in commendations, uh, commendations. So that when you finish the map, it gives you an MVP. It'll say... Yeah, Butcher, you played really well, man. You did some decent damage. Butcher's really scary now, by the way. Um, and then oh, yeah. you get to upvote just like Overwatch. This is just, you know, it's a good way to make people feel good at the end of the game. 
How do you guys yeah. feel about it? I think it's excellent. I think it is actually the kind of system that you don't you don't think it'll be that impactful, but I think it will actually be a really big deal in terms of like player retention for Hero League and stuff and getting people to want to queue back up and play those Hero League games and try their best and not be toxic and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Because there's just something that feels nice about getting upvotes at the end of games. So like I think it actually is the kind of system that will really help the game. Um so a well, quick question on that upvote system. Uh, can you chat during it? Yeah. Or is it like just to your team? Okay, friendly. that's see, that's that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> that's what we're like. So when uh, in Korea, I play like a lot of heroes. Obviously, like a ton. I only play on the Korean server basically because it's too laggy to play on NA. That's why I don't play too much PTR. And then uh, I play Overwatch a lot. And like that's the moment where everyone's like, "See, fuck you," because I'm better. Like, look at my card is there, <laughs> and like. I worry that in Korea, people are going to try to get these cards to pop up and try to get MVP, and then afterwards, even if they were terrible and all they did was, like, solo Merc Camps the whole game, they will be like, see, look, I'm right, and fuck you. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, like, my biggest concern about, about that. So I personally am really excited about it. I think uh, it's going to be a good system, but in, in Korea, everyone's super toxic in Hero League, and <laughs> I, I hope that it works out, but I'm, like, cautiously optimistic about it. I'll just wait and see. Yeah, I've seen a couple a couple funny instances too where like last night a medic got an eleven kill streak and it was like Dominator title for Medic and it was like got the most <laughs> kills and bloodshed on the map. Just because of the way like kills work in heroes. But mm-hmm. and then other times like we had some like a butcher just like doing work the entire game, but then like we also had a murky just split pushing the whole time, and then he just got the MVP for like full experience mode. And oh, it's gosh. just there's a lot of these like weird situations. And then Right now, with the current implementation, it, implementation, it like pops up for like five seconds and then it's just gone. And it's kind of like it feels a little rough around the edges still because you're just kind of like, oh, let me just like click on my little star. Oh, it, oh, we're done. Okay, it's gone. Like we're out of the game now. You can't like leave yeah. it on your own. You know, it just kind of takes you out of it. So while it is very cool, it definitely needs a little bit more polish. But I think it's a good thing for heroes to have. It's a step in the right direction for heroes to have that sort of system. Here's what we need, though. We just need we need play of the game where it's literally just a medic auto attacking a merc camp and dying. And then that's the play of the game. Like, that's what we need. Because yeah, play of the games need to be the next step. Hey, who knows? Yeah. I mean, obviously, this is this is directly inspired from Overwatch. Like, it's Overwatch has seen great response to this. You know, it feels you have this feel good moment after the game. Um, they even have the same upvote thing. They didn't call it legendary. If you get ten, I think it's heroic um, uh, when you get ten upvotes. But still, it's it's really cool, and it's just a nice little thing, right? And whereas, like, currently, all there is to do after a game is report that guy that you hate, right? It's like you know, well, screw that guy. He didn't heal me enough because I overextended the whole game. Therefore, it's his fault. So he deserves to be reported because he's a feeder because <laughs> I fed because he didn't heal me. Uh, that's the kind of logic that we have right now after the game. But now it's just like boom, 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 requeue, and it feels it feels dynamic. Uh, so props to them on rolling that out this quickly. I mean, I I can't imagine that. Uh, this is like a new thing for them. They probably had to have already been working on it uh, prior to I, Overwatch's launch. I, I think like a, a sort of highlight video play of the game type thing is is potentially going to be really awesome. I think that um, if, if they ever added that in, it would be very hard to implement. We, there would definitely be some funny ones that didn't it's make sense. So but like, hard. but like if if that even if the funny ones come out that don't make sense, like that's also really funny. I think it's... the Overwatch community grew super fast because they had this, and even like. One of the reasons why Smash 4 grew so quickly is because uh, the subreddit exploded with like four glory highlights that people made, you know, off of their their streams and stuff. Gif-ability, and I, I think that right? yeah. it, it, if it's, it, yeah. you need gifable things. I think that like that's something that would help heroes grow a lot. I agree. Um, and eventually, maybe hopefully, that would help grow the competitive scene because I feel like heroes right now, when I go to the subreddit, which is basically the only real good website to discuss anything for heroes, you go there and it's like. I have like an exciting match happens or I'm watching, you know, an A regional or I just cast an amazing care game and I go there and the top post is like, does anyone else think Arthas still looks like he has a plastic sword? And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> God. <laughs> That's my favorite so, thing. I, I hope that like if I mean if this happened, obviously the subreddit, for example, would probably be filled with like gifs and, and memes for a while, but I I hope that like that would grow the subreddit, or grow the game, and then more people want to watch the esports. So uh, I think it would be a good thing. Very obviously hard to implement, but I think it's something that kind of is almost necessary in, in like the world we live in of like instant jiffing and instant um, video making. 
and content. Instant meme, memeing, yeah. Wait. The memes are important, man. It's going to be like a... a, a a position that you have on the board of directors, you know, director of memes, like for every game now, it's just gonna, you have to have somebody who helps like promote that sort of silly stuff in a community because like it is important. That's true. Um, crap. I wanted to say something and I forgot entirely. I'm just so good at life, but yeah, memeing is good. Memeing is great. And so are some of these other changes. Grandmaster league down to 200. <laughs> uh, Duncus, you, yeah. you happy about that? Yeah. I mean, it. I think it's fine. I I didn't see the need to make that change, given the system they already rolled out. Like, when it first came out, yeah, 500, like, saying you're 450 Grandmaster doesn't really mean that much, I think, to, like, at least competitive players. That, that doesn't mean that much. So having 200 means at least competitive players when they say they're Grandmaster. It potentially means something, but even then... I feel like it wasn't hurting anyone to have those extra 300 slots, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I feel like this is just a neutral shift. I, I'm going to bite my tongue. I mean, it makes it more special, right? I mean, I guess, like, yeah, uh, because, I mean, right now, like, almost anyone's GM, but if you um, if you narrow it down, I think it makes it more special in a way. I guess that's basically what they're going for. I kind of like the bigger one because I feel like it gives more people the idea of, like, I can keep pushing for this. I can keep going for this. Um, and that's uh, something I think is really important to keep the player base growing. And in StarCraft, when there's only 200, it was very much like you feel like you, someone has to drop out so you can get in. Otherwise, you just have to wait till next season. And I know Heroes doesn't work quite like that, but I think the more slots means more motivation. Yeah, that's a good point. And one thing that this is going to do just with the way that like hero league works it's just gonna be like in and out of it so much if you're like hovering right up there at like the top master level and it's kind of weird to be like in grandmaster for like a couple games and then be out of grandmaster and like it's just it it's kind of strange to me like to have that sort of constant fluctuation that are that people experience that are right on the edge um and i i agree with you wolf i think like for especially a lot of the you know amateur scene type of stuff where people are they want to be in Grandmaster to, you know, try and find other good Grandmasters to play with and, like, you know, form a team. And it is kind of a cool thing that people feel like they've actually really achieved something great by being in one of those slots. So, I don't know. I, I kind of like the the bigger pool as well, but it is going to make it a little bit more glamorous to be a Grandmaster now. And it truly is a great accomplishment to be, like, a top 200 Grandmaster. So It is. And, like... I'll be honest. Like I was, I was thinking about doing an event later this year that would be, um, like maybe maybe I was gonna do like an ARM event or maybe I was gonna do a one v one event or something. And I want to open it up to the community, but I, I was thinking like it would be cool to run an exhibition event that's exclusive to GM players, right? Say you have yeah. to be top two hundred to make it into this event, and then you give people something to work towards for this special event, and that gives you a reason to just grind and hit GM. And if you drop out before really... the event, you're you're dumpstered. Get out, ha. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's really cool that being jammed also gives you a number mm-hmm. because otherwise you just tell everyone like oh, I'm diamond one or, or you know I'm masters but like doesn't really tell you as much as when you're like okay well I was ranked 430 yesterday but today I went up to 230 and now I'm like trying to get top 100 and it's like Hearthstone legendary or legend or whatever, whatever that's actually called yeah. you know where you yeah. actually you finally get this feeling of like I know exactly where I stand and when I tell someone I'm GM, I can tell them like, also I'm not, I'm not like 492 GM. I'm I'm actually like top 20 or I'm top 50. And I think that um, narrowing the slots makes that mm-hmm. better for those top 200 people. But the 500 number was like, okay, even though I'm still not as good as I'm not like top 100, I can still tell you exactly where I stand in in GM standing. So I, again, I did personally like the the bigger number. Yeah, because people that are at that tip top level can just be like, yeah, I'm a top 50 GM in NA. You know, like they can they can sort of describe where they're at at a higher level without it having to be explicitly grandmaster at like top 200. They can just be like, yeah, I'm a top 200 GM, which means more than just being like, oh, yeah, like I just broke into GM. So agreed. OK, a um, few other big changes here that just kind of affect the game fully in general, as we, we kind of alluded to this earlier, but the mount speed has been reduced. Um I think they, they did talk about this a little bit, but obviously this is going to slow rotations down. I, I don't know if it was Blizzard that officially released the exact like time change that it is they from, did, from yeah. lane to lane. 
Uh, but it is, it's an impactful thing. What do you guys think? The, the mount speed reduction you're talking yeah. about specifically? Yeah. I, I think, I get the feeling that Blizzard is trying to make the laning phase more of a thing and more impactful because instead of, um, and this has like been going on for a while, I was talking to people about this in Sweden even, with the globe changes and the regen changes they were talking about, I think they're clearly trying to make it less of a death ball for people run around on mm -hmm. horses and kill people and, and, and just take over the map. Yeah. Um, and they're trying to make it like, okay, so staying in lane is important and ganks are meaningful. If you miss, if you mess up the gank, like you lose a lot. And I think that's really important. And I actually think it's a really good change. Like I'm actually a super big fan of this. It's like right now, the way it is, is you kind of just have four man roam gank squads, even on bigger maps, you could still do it and you don't miss as much. And I think that the minion changes as well kind of are trying to go in this direction. It's like, okay, if you do a four-man gank, you mess it up or you fight too long there, then you also get your, your towers pushed down, you lose a lot of health on those. So I'm a big fan of the of the change to the, the movement speed. And like you you mentioned, like the minion changes, obviously if you leave a lane alone, that's a problem. Same thing with the, the mercenary camp changes, which we'll get to in a bit. You leave those alone, that's a problem. You need to get to them. And the other big ch change here is the globe change. So with all this tied together, globes expire more quickly. They're harder to get to. It seems like winning a lane and denying globes is going to be easier and more impactful because those rotations are harder to come by. Dunk, when we wrap all of these together in this new package of the future hots, like... Do you think it's going to make the game like a little bit more competitive or just kind of change the way that the game functions in a way? It will absolutely change the way the game functions. I'm concerned about the potential. I think everyone is concerned about this when you first think about this, like the split push Zagara or the Sylvanas backdoor that you're not already in position to respond to. Like two extra seconds on a rotation to catch a Sylvanas backdoor is the difference between your wall being at like all the buildings are at half or something, or like your whole wall is dead. Like instead of losing 75% of a tower and salvaging it and not getting behind an XP, now if you pick the wrong lane at level one, you lost a wall instantly. Like you cannot rotate, so you have to trade. And I hate the level one like trade race situation. I think that's really bad mm -hmm. for the viewer experience. So I'm that's my biggest concern. But overall, I really like everything else about what I think this change will bring to the game. Just to throw it out there, should structures be invincible for the first minute of the game or something? Just to um, make it so that can't be a thing. I would like that if you could not damage structures until minions pass the gate or meet in the middle. Like, I mean, I, to be fair, I have been a proponent of backdoor protection since, like, the in inception of Heroes. Like, I have always believed that you just shouldn't be able to just walk at a building and kill it with no minions around. Um, I know that's not the most popular opinion in Heroes, especially because of the role of specialists and having people with summons, should those count, etc. But that's just my personal opinion. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think there should be something to protect that. I, I wish towers were just, like, super powerful early game, like, buff, buff their damage. I know they already did, like, a while back now, yeah. but, like, I would love to, for the towers to just be more powerful um, because it also feels like ganking and diving towers is like super easy. And I know maybe that Blizzard wants that to be the case. So you can have these exciting moments where like a zero tool, like vorpals over the wall and he gets out, you know, but I think towers might be too weak. What if towers just have like a slow, like a key pass or something like that, maybe a little bit less of a slow, but something like that, where these kind of moves are, are less, uh, powerful and a lot harder to pull off. I think that would be the case, uh, you know, if they buff the towers, cause I agree. My, my biggest issue with all this is like the level one scramble where you know it's like oh god they all pushed bot and we went mid because we thought because they normally go mid but they went bot this time and <laughs> it's not even smart but like we guessed wrong and like it's mm -hmm. it's totally goofy and i don't like it so yeah yeah okay yeah it does feel like there's that weird level of just guessing where a team's gonna go and that shouldn't really be what the level one's all about is just like gambling on like oh did this will go top or bottom with the four man let's find yeah. out we lose yeah. our entire fort and um <laughs> I also think like with the mount speed changes, it does it's gonna put a lot more pressure on players on the stage, you know, to make those ganks on rotation. And if you do commit to a gank right now, it's like Murden just jumps no matter where he is, just jump over the wall, throw a stun, and like if you miss it, it doesn't matter. Like you probably didn't miss anything anyways, you just walk away and go back to the other lane and farm it. But now it's like, you know, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna commit to that and actually have like a Murden committed to getting a gank and you've given up like um, a really good try lane in the draft or something, and you have a lot more pressure on you as that Murden player to like make this super high impact moment count. So 
more pressure on the players overall just like makes the competitive scene like more tense and i like that can yeah, i think that? uh I, I think like heroes like Zeratul, Tracer, these heroes that can go snipe a Sylvanas, like they're going to be, um, the plays have to be like a lot crisper, but I think there's a lot more reward for that and vision control and things like this. Because if you are Zeratul and you do miss that gank, like you're just gone for so long, uh, you know, or even Tracer, even though she has blink and she can move pretty quickly, like you're just, you're gone. You're, you're like in that period of time where you're going from top lane back to mid lane, like say on Cursed Hollow, like, that time period is actually going to be much longer now that you're you're missing and that you might actually, your mid lane might get pushed because you were gone because you wanted to get the skank. So you really need to hit it or maybe just decide like, eh, this isn't safe. Let's not go. So I, I think it's going to make decision making a little bit tougher for that. But I think it's going to show teams that have like really good decision making, you know, like uh, like the the Korean teams that are good at rotation. Some of some teams like Temple Storm is finally starting to get a little bit better at it, but they're like mostly... Uh, good at team fighting teams that are good at team fighting and just this death ball style might like kind of fall out of favor for a while uh, until they can get smart enough to know like when it's time to roam and when it's time to to lane and i think that will laning phase kind of extends a little bit longer as well yeah but that's not even the only thing they're changing we we already talked about this briefly they're they're starting to change up the mercenary camps and the way they function a little bit uh, in two big ways. So now mercenary camps are now staggered. There, there's not going to be multiple spawns all happening at the same time. You got 90 seconds for the sappers and the doubloon pirates. It's 120 seconds for the siege giants uh, the, or the siege camps. The bruiser camps, which are the knights and the fallen shaman, that's 150 seconds. The boss is uh, going to be 180, and then they have this horseman is 300. The the bigger change here is that when they die once they're already captured and pushing in lane they don't give the enemy team experience so now being the yeah. one that initially caps the camp and getting that experience is like an experience it's that's extra xp that's experience that wasn't available elsewhere that your opponent is not going to get so now stealing yeah. camps actually have this added benefit of giving your team more xp um dunk this is a pretty cool change right do you like this this change is huge i think this is actually going to be really, really impactful, especially on PvE-oriented maps like Blackheart's Bay and Dragonshire, where there's a lot of camps going on. There's potential for steals, and getting that XP back is pretty insane. It was not there initially in Alpha, really. The mercenary camps that the enemies had didn't give you XP or give you very little, and then they added that, and it it's kind of like uh, this change is going to increase the snowballiness a mm -hmm. lot from on the maps where you get mercenaries early. Like, getting a couple of early mercenary camps actually could cost you pretty hard in the old way because if they deny any experience from you by, like, backdooring a wave, like, if you think about Blackheart's Bay or something where you sneak, like, a backside Siege Giants or Cursed Hollow and then they kill a wave and then the enemy kills them, like, not only did you deny yourself a wave because you weren't there to soak the wave that the Siege Giants killed and then the enemy gets back the experience you got anyway from the Siege Giants, like, that's huge. Mm -hmm. So now they won't get that XP back, and I think it's actually going to be pretty big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what What if, like, what if there was actually now, because of this change, like, I'm just theory crafting a little bit, this might be crazy, one of your heroes in your draft is, like, designed to solo camps, because you, or, and even steal camps and invade bribe becomes, like, a lot more popular and more powerful mm -hmm. as a result, because if you have, you know, bribe, you can actually steal these camps, and you're basically just getting extra EXP. If you have someone in every lane and you're stealing all the caps and you're just going to get ahead in EXP like in general and you're going to push the lanes harder, it almost feels like a jungler type role could could even emerge from this. Yeah, speaking of of bribe as well, like they've just reworked a ton of bribe talents with this patch or at least like buff them and change them around to be a little bit more uh, impactful. Like, I mean, perfect uh, transition there, Jake. The Falstad wingman talent so now cool. that gives you it's is it five or ten percent per bribe set or is it? Five percent for every bribe stack. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a lot. Like I was up to forty yeah. percent pretty quickly when I was playing trying out Falstad, and um, of course, yeah, you got the Nova one now too. And just like I think it's cool that they're trying to add this this functionality. The Brightwing one. Did you see the Brightwing one? That yeah, dude, that's bribe so stacks sick. Soothing passive, so cool. Dude, it's and it's um, powerful. It's like there's this incentive, there's additional incentive to get Merc camps and draft for those type of heroes. Yeah, it yeah, seems like they like really Brightwing, want that to be a thing. Brightwing can go steal a camp and then teleport into a team fight. Like she just goes over and she moves fairly quickly. So she just ease herself and goes over to steal a siege giant camp because she was in the team fight before. So she stacked up bribe stacks and then just 
teleports in the team fight, like after sitting a camp top, she can clear basically instantly with her her bribes. It makes uh, Brightwing really powerful. Falstad as well is a very similar type of hero. If he has the bribe stacks, then he can go to a top you know camp, steal the opponent shaman camp, and then fly into the team fight. Um, it makes these global presence heroes like a lot more impactful and uh, in a good way, like in a healthy way. I feel where these kind of movements and in in like ganking then becomes a thing, or like can I bait? I think the Falstad's about to go try to take our camp, so I'm going to leave Zeratul there. Or Tracer's going to go up and, and kill Falstad and. Um, there's just like so much counterplay that you can do as well. I think these changes are really good for the game. And I think people talked about the last patch is like removing Unstoppable from Rudin is like the biggest patch here has ever seen. I think this one actually could be the, the big one that like makes the game so much better personally. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, the complexity of having to draft for a larger map now, like when it comes to like having the presence of, of someone that can go into those Merc camps, sure, you can still go with the Illidan or the Sonya to get the early Bruiser camp or whatever safely fall back and soak them but also you you know the false that's always going to be a staple now brightwing has additional viability with that talent because again she's going to be able to bribe things frequently that was always a thing in towers of doom but the other interesting thing is since the rotations take longer i'm curious if you guys feel there might be more room for things like scouting drone or clairvoyance or talents that give you vision because if it takes you longer to do this if mercenary camps have more merit those are all talents that used to get picked up pretty frequently, right? We used to see Cursed Hollow where you'd want Taronda for the Owls. You would want uh, Tassadar for the Oracle. That vision was so important. But in the, in the meta nowadays, it's pretty predictable the way the map's going to go out. And we almost never see any prioritization, maybe the rare scouting drone on Medic. Uh, and that's about it. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's like a good point. Um, I think those, the problem with some of those talents, the vision talents, like Scouting Drone, is they give you vision, but they don't give you anything else. Like, I think those talents are sometimes weak because mm -hmm. you get the vision, but you don't get anything else. Like, if that talent was like, oh, you have a Scouting Drone and you passively have, like, 1% more health regen or something like that, it'd be, like, a little bit more um, exciting to take those talents and people would take them more often. But now it is kind of like, I have this thing that could be easily destroyed and it gives me a little bit of vision, but it's not that important overall. I think with the changes to movement speed, though, you can't just, like, check with your warrior, have him just on a horse running around, finding uh, everything and, and getting vision of everything. So definitely could be stronger going forward. But I think those talents, some of them are just very weak compared to the trade-off talents that you could get instead, which is why it's cool that, like, Tassar exists, that Zagar exists, because you just kind of have these things baseline. Um, Lunara as well, you know, having her wisp to be able to check things. That's true. But it'd be cool if those talents got buffed in some way. To where like almost like warding kind of becomes a thing or if there if it was more widely available to heroes that'd be cool too i think in general the map layouts aren't really conducive to it either like there is a lot of value of having zgar or whatever because she's insane plus she brings vision but like to spend an extra talent on vision on anyone other than medic because she's so vulnerable to flanks feels like a waste because a lot of the times it doesn't feel like there's enough options on the map for the extra vision to give you information that changes your plan. Like, it's not like there's so many different things that they could be doing or ways they could be rotating and flanking that you feel like you get an advantage from knowing where they are. It's usually like one or two options at any given time. Yeah, I mean, like, in other MOBAs, uh, rotations happen a lot slower because they don't ride horses <laughs> to, to get to them. So. <laughs> So I feel like in Heroes, when you see a rotation coming, you don't have that much time to react anyways. Like, you can't... If you see someone coming, you can't have someone come from another lane to help out as quickly. It's kind of like he comes in while you're already fighting. But now that the mounts are getting slower, maybe it could be better to know. But I still just don't think... I think the trade-off is just too bad to take these talents because the other talents are just so much more powerful than them. And I think Blitter did a good job of buffing the heroics that are underpicked by giving them more, um, just adding extra passives to them. And I think that's something they could definitely do for these talents to make them a little bit more uh, desirable, I guess. But yeah, I mean, I, I do like if you feel like if you see it's coming, it doesn't help you that much, anyways. And some of the maps, the distance between the lanes is so small. Like on Tomb of the Spire, I mean, like, okay, so what? You just, like you already saw them leave the lane, and they're going to be there instantly. Like having that drone there isn't going to be helpful unless. You're just not paying attention, you know. Maybe yeah. for like casual players, it could be helpful, but yeah. like stitches is gone. Like you shouldn't get hooked because you don't see him on the mini map. So having a scouting drone there already tells you what you already knew. It's like stitches is probably just in that vent waiting to try to hook you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now this seems like the deeper motivation or like the big picture that Blizzard is going for. 
make rotations more expensive and reward a team for having that like decisional control of the map. So like bribes are more impactful, which of course you have to rotate to deal with the push from the minions. Um, the mount speeds are slower, so it's harder for you to just kind of like group up and zerg around the map all the time. Vision can be more impactful because of rotations being like a little bit slower. So yeah, like all in all, the the bottom line is that rotations are just being they're, they're, it's more expensive to commit your resources around the map like that instead of knowing exactly what you want to do and having a tactical plan from the beginning. I like it. It's gonna make it. Uh, it's gonna make a lot of teams have to adjust drastically you know when it comes to just split pressure and uh mark camp prioritization and all of those things being higher topics um everyone agree that these are good changes or is anybody wary about these changes i i think they're amazing i'm i'm like a big fan like two thumbs up for me i'm not i'm not really worried about these changes myself i'm gonna give it one thumbs up like i i think it's i think it's good but I'm still waiting to see kind of how it affects the game. You know what I mean? Like, but I'm, I'm all for it. I like what they're trying to do to put more pressure on the tension of the game to see like big plays actually paying off or not paying off and being a disaster. Dunk. I agree. I, I agree with Kale. Okay. I'm, I'm a little hesitant and cautious to go with the hardcore two thumbs up. Like, well, <laughs> that's I a mean, big I respect commitment, that. man. Yeah, that is a big commitment. I mean, I like the direction they obviously want to go. I'm just a little worried again about, some of the ways this could end up interacting because you can have the best of intentions, but you just don't actually know how it's going to turn out. Dunk's just saying Sylvanas is a dumb character deleted from the game. This could be okay. <laughs> That's the impression I get. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay. Well, we've got time to talk about one more thing here on the PTR. We're not going to go through all the hero balance changes just because, well, we just simply don't have time tonight. I know Ko's like, I want to talk about Vala. But you're going to have to wait, uh, Ko. Uh, so Relentless gosh. is being reworked. Now, Relentless has always been, you know, stun duration reduction. But now it's basically 25% less damage received um, on most of these heroes. And their explanation was... It wasn't always intuitive. They didn't like it. Therefore, they're changing it. Uh, the players didn't know what was going on. I feel like they. I feel like Blizzard just got like hordes of reports, bug reports from players being like, "I stunned the guy and he didn't get stunned." And Blizzard's like, "Could you just read the thirteen talent? He took yeah. relentless. Come on!" And it's been around forever. Pressing tab, pressing tab isn't just for seeing how much hero damage you have. You can actually yeah. like check <laughs> people's talents. Like <laughs> you can see what's going on. Um, so yeah, I, I I'm actually not a big fan of this change because I feel like it was such a cool thing that certain heroes had, and I think it did feel really impactful. I think Blizzard was like, nah, yeah, it's like sometimes you just didn't really even realize they had. I'm like, no, I'm not not buying. The one thing that. I would agree with is that like it is a thing that I feel like a higher higher level players un understand and will see that, but the newer like you know people who d maybe don't grasp the game as much yet. It might be a little bit harder for them to understand why the character isn't getting, you know, crowd controlled for longer. But that's part of the complexity of games, right? And every game has their their varying levels of different things that you might not understand at face value. So I think it's okay to have the, some of that stuff in the game. And I, I agree. I think it's a little weird that they just decide they don't like it anymore. Now, as former C9 stun meta. 2015 uh <laughs> does this does this help it at all is this like uh something that's gonna make stun heroes slightly more prominent um in really specific matchups maybe but i feel like those heroes all got nerfed pretty hard and yeah. it's not really an option like mostly because the taronda nerfs i would say like muradin is amazing right now because of the whole healing static thing which they didn't do anything about this patch. Like Surprising. they made some slight tweaks, but it doesn't look like it actually does anything to his overall effectiveness. Um, but I don't think you're going to see the same like one shot compositions come back. Okay. It's only 25% extra like armor, basically right. the resistance, right? Seconds. So I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, if you if you're getting stun locked together, you're probably dead no matter what. So I feel like it's not. It's just not as good anymore. Like. To, like obviously yeah almost so. all those talents are awful yeah almost mm -hmm. all of them yeah i would say which is it's actually kind of weird like i feel like relentless wasn't a problem like you weren't even taking it that off i don't know about you guys or even in competitive like n nobody was taking it like you weren't seeing five relentlesses every game Not you were seeing while. like one or two sometimes 
And like, I yeah. don't know. Yeah, it's I mean, like weird. It, it, what you saw, like Ker- Karazim, like Chen, you know, like yeah. some of these heroes where it's like almost a must pick, and then it was kind of this interesting thing where you'd see, like, okay, there's a lot of stuns on their team, so they chose this, and yeah. like, as you know, as a commentator, it's like an interesting thing to talk about, but. Yeah, now, I mean, I guess some, some heroes might still take it just because their uh, options are, are terrible. But, like, for the most part, I think it's going to get super low priority now just because it's yeah. not as, it's just literally not as good as it was before. It's a big nerf. Fair enough. Well, as we mentioned, there's a lot of other big changes in the PTR. You can find the patch notes at heroesofthestorm.com. Butcher mm-hmm. is actually pretty good seeming. Vala has seen a lot of changes. There's a lot of them in there. Uh, but just, we're not going to be going Jake. with. One last thing All right. that I noticed Blizzard doing is that they, it seems like what they're doing is like taking the most popular things that a character kind of identifies with and like lumping it right into their kit. Like Night Takes right? Pawn? Like, did you see like Murden with the, the oh, yeah, and yeah. then Johanna Night Takes Pawn as part of the kit? Yeah. So this That's is good. another thing. That's great. It's like, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's cool that they're just like, these are talents that, that characters or players refuse to, I mean, uh, refuse to not take on these characters. They're going to take these talents. So at this point, it no longer offers variety. Like, just give them the talent in, as part of the kit. There's that, so, and they're trying to they're trying to make cool. traits more compelling. Like, you look at all yeah. our traits compelling. Now Vala's trait is more compelling. It's you know, it, it's really critical to her play style to farm that trait, and she has a lot more flexibility. And the same with the Butcher. His trait is is really a key element, um, you know, more so than it ever was before. So, yeah, I, I think it's a it's like a good thing once you really identify what a hero is doing. I'm surprised they didn't touch Tassadar because he's like one of those heroes you could just make calls and brace baseline or something because that's like so important as to like who he is and, and everything he does. And I, he needs he needs uh, he needs a big change though. If they're gonna change him at all, I think they need to do a lot. They need to like make his kit way more like diverse. So, yeah, like all of his talents have like an eighty percent plus pick rate. Like yeah. the or, you know, the ones that are actually in his build. So. I like these changes a lot because it does feel like you finally have options. Like, I want to play Johanna more because she has basically Night Takes Pawn automatically. She does. It's great. Um, so it's really cool stuff. It's, they're doing great jo- a great job with the, the game design, the balance, the updates to a lot of these heroes that haven't seen changes in a while. And uh, I highly suggest you guys try out the PTR or at least read the patch notes. And we'll, we'll definitely be sure to talk about that in a future show. Um, but while we have Wolf here, I really wanted to, to get wolf in to talk to us a little bit about the korean scene so we can make some comparisons to the western metas you know europe and this is gonna be exciting have a lot of differences as it is um but korea is well they're king korea is been incredibly dominant basically all year long and uh well wolf you know what take it away i'll let you drive um i'm excited to see this upcoming uh blizzcon because uh i think that uh and i've been pretty adamant about these predictions since the beginning i think that mvp black and mvp miracle are both going and so you guys are going to get to see that resurgence of mvp i think that uh rain is frowning people, somewhere yeah i mean i a lot of people were saying that temple storm was like that's it now because they won um sweden but i like to remind people they only won by one game like it was a really close series yeah. and after that everyone forgot about black because they didn't play in power league and that's why black is so good right now i think it's because they did take that break I talked to Mary Day at length about this, like how important it is to take a break um, and how he feels like that impacted the team. And he's like, we're totally new again. Like we're, we're totally new. We have a sister team now and they exclusively practice with each other. They do not scrim other teams. A lot of other teams are yeah. upset about that, but like they just are like, nope, just us. And that's all so, there is. And they kind of like, that, I was just curious, like, so they, they, they just took this break, like completely like stepped away from it for a little while. Yeah. They just yeah. they just totally like stop playing competitive hots for a while and then just I, that's just it seems weird to me practice. for a Korean organization to like have that approach. I don't know if it's just like the the whole like fallacy of them just you know being like the hardest workers all the time. They never do anything but play the competitive game. But it does it is surprising that like that's the approach that they went for. I'll be honest with you though, and like so many other esports players have done the same thing. Um, where they they just need to disengage, and that not only does it like it, it refreshes you, it re- reinvigorates your motivation. It um, you break bad habits, you kind of reapproach, so you become less predictable. People start to understand your rotations or like certain elements of your play in X, Y, and Z way. And if you step away for nine weeks or whatever it is, guess what? You come back and you're looking at the game from a new perspective. It's a super healthy thing yeah. to do for all pro gamers. Yeah, I, I like. 
I mean, look at Miracle's draft against uh, Tempo Storm in the Busan opening, where they took Rainer, and, and like they clearly tried to like beat this composition that Tempo Storm plays all the time with Tyrael and Greymane, and they just kind of like countered it, and they were really safe, and they backed off and poked at it. That was the moment to me where I saw that I was like, damn, okay, these guys are really focused on like countering this. They're hiding everything they're doing. They're only scrimming with Black. And that was the moment where I was like, okay, these two teams are going to be sick. And we already knew that the Miracle had star players on them. Right. Uh, and Black, like, was in the background. And everyone was worried, like, uh, in the Korean scene, like, oh, is Black going to come back strong? We're not sure. But once I saw Miracle play, I knew that, I mean, these are the teams to beat right now. I think Tempo Storm is actually having some issues. They're role swapping. Um, Hong Kono is, like, trying to take on like he wants to be the carry now he doesn't want to be the tank anymore he's thinking about even rebranding oh, no dude that's, it's not good not tempo storm roll swaps no um, I'm, <laughs> go there. I'm really uh not feeling it um i know you guys have your own different, different reasons why but uh i'm i'm not a big fan of uh of the roll swaps they're doing right now and i think it's going to make them weak at this most important moment where they need to go to BlizzCon. And like Temple Storm is the biggest investment we've ever had into the Korean scene from outside. And they, they're only going to get a return on that if they go to BlizzCon. And if they don't go to BlizzCon, it's all, it almost feels like it's all for nothing. So uh, it, within the team, I also talked to the players and I was like, is Hong Kong kind of like making this happen? Are you guys kind of like pressured because he's, he's doing this and like, he's such a great player and like, no, no we all agreed this is the, the best way. I'm like, because I don't agree with you guys on that. I don't think the roll swaps are good. I think roll swap later, like after BlizzCon or something, but like stick with what you know now. Yeah. Um, but then yeah. again, they roll swap to win uh, OGN season two. So, <laughs> I mean, I could be totally off base here. Yeah. Hmm. Well, there's no doubt that, I mean, when Tempest Storm picked up uh, Tempest, you know, that was, it was pretty early on. And as far as results go to, you know, commit to a team like that. So there's, you know, it's definitely like a very open-ended risks type of thing. And there's a lot of hype behind Tempest, which they deserve for, you know, coming out and looking so strong out of nowhere. And like, you know, they, they're definitely a, a great team of great players, but they, they still have to prove themselves in consistency, which is a tough thing to do. And, and they have to um, go against Rich, who now has oh, Butcher yeah. in his arsenal for future events. And I don't know if you guys saw this 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 play. This was just like Rich going to town on Hero League. It's actually yeah. disgusting. I like, literally just match. watched that before I came on the show. It's it's crazy. <laughs> He's out of control, good man. He has no uh, I, no right to be alive right now. Um, I don't know how much uh, the NA scene actually watches Super League. Like, um, or like if you guys do, you know, like watch often, but this guy is like out of control. Oh, Rich is a God. He is an absolute God. Uh, but yeah, he's terrifying, man. And I actually, I had the chance to talk to Mary Day about this specifically the other night, um, when I was out with him and he's, I told, I asked him like, what, why did you guys pick him up? Like, were you guys worried? You know, um, like I was like, can you just tell me honestly, like, cause he was such a controversial figure cause he was posting on like Korean 4chan which is like a big no-no. Like Koreans are not cool with that. Like that's like a place where you are only anonymous and you're embarrassed to post on. And like people found that it was him. They were really upset about that. Um, and he was like the guy who had to have his enter key removed um, to play on Snake. That was like the agreement to join the team because he was so oh toxic God. on the ladder. Like he, they were like, all right, if you join our team, you play with your enter key removed so you can't chat. So his keyboard <laughs> has like the enter key removed. Um, when lockdown decided to leave the team, though, Mary Day told me. The black was like, we want to be the best, and the only way we can be the best if we have, is if we have rich. It's the only way this is going to work. And the coach is like, are you sure? Because I mean, he's like a bit, you know, he might be a bit ragey. Like, is he going to work with the team? And the players were not worried about that at all. And then when he joined the team, everyone was like, okay, this guy's personality and his aggressiveness is something that we needed in our team. We were too passive, we were too quiet, we didn't discuss things enough. And he came in and he was just like, no, this is bad. You're terrible. You need to work on this. And it's like, it just really helped the team overall. I'm talking about Rich specifically. Dude, he's a god. Like everyone... I feel like teams will almost always pick the the player who is maybe harder to work with. If they're if they're mechanically and just naturally talented, like God tier, players will always pick that player regardless of their personality issues most of the time because it's just like they bring so much to the team. You know what I mean? And if like if you guys work out as a team because you're winning, the personality issues won't be a problem. But if you're losing, then it's going to all flare up and, and, of course, explode in your face. But, like, you probably weren't going to win anyways at that point. So 
So it's interesting how how those how those kind of picks influence teams, but it works out very well for Black. Uh, I don't know if you guys want to talk about this because you guys know. I mean, I know if I've even interacted with you on this about uh, on this about uh, about this on Twitter, Dunk, uh, about the role swaps and and uh, team uh, roster apocalypses that happen in North America. And like, I think everyone has different opinions on this. I really feel like staying together is the way to go. Um, but I think it, there's obviously a compelling argument that if you're losing, it's harder to stay together than if you're winning. And even in Korea, the teams that lose like do. Uh, break up a lot but i think they break up less like they'll swap two players out and uh, north american teams come as just like totally throw someone out after like just one tournament or one qualifier uh so, i mean so sell me on the the breakups well let previously. me ask you a question before we even get to that in korea typically speaking there's a coach in a form of authority that all of the players respect correct yeah, that's something we don't have. Like generally speaking, most teams don't have a form of authority that they look to as a governing body of the team. Generally speaking, they're a group of five guys that interact with each other. There's someone that acts as a manager and assists with you know planning and travel and making sure they're taken care of. But there's there there for whatever reason there's gen I, I've noticed like they don't necessarily look at them as like their boss or like that that the the, gov the governing body of the team and without that it's it's really tough to um basically enforce anything and once there's conflict teams tend to take sides from what i've noticed where like two or three people buddy up and then they decide they want to pin this person and force that person out of the team which might pull someone else with it and then creates a lot of turmoil then that team starts to have bad results and then that team has a bad tournament and they explode. And that's basically what happens in NA. Yeah, so I, I think that this coaching figure is like, uh, the part of the reason why it doesn't exist is because there's not big sponsors uh, in oh, NA yeah. right now. Yeah. And there, there was before, but I think a lot of the sponsorship that existed, um, even Cloud9 and Dunk could probably speak on this, is, is like big investment hoping that Heroes was gonna explode faster than it did. And so once it didn't, like they stuck around for a little bit longer, but there was not like big investment to like, we need coaches, we need top tier yeah. management. And in Korea, we have a little bit of that, like Black has that, obviously Tempo Storm has that, but for the most part, it's uh, it's kind of like, still you just respect this person for who they are. But yeah. I'll let uh, Dunk speak on the, the coaching thing for Cloud9. Yeah, I've discussed this with other people too. I know I've talked with Dread about this quite a bit and like, so Jake mentioned a couple things that I think are actually the two most important factors. So one is not having that coaching pick, uh, figure and like the sort of third party respectable person means that you have no one to break up political games, which are a big problem in teams that start to have issues. Like when you have issues, if you get into like a scenario where all of a sudden you have people splitting three, two, or like you have two against two and you have a swing vote, like in all of basically what your team's decisions are it basically like ruins team cohesion honestly like it messes up your motivation it messes up your comms mess up everything and the fact that you can't basically trust anyone on your team to be not biased anymore becomes a problem because you don't have a third like a coach is in a sense a third party yeah he's invested in the team but he should be like um looking for a word like neutral. he should be fair he should yeah. be neutral like yeah. he should be fair to everyone on the team like if you make a mistake he shouldn't side with someone just because he wants to side with that faction or whatever, which is what happens right. in actual teams because a lot of people are kids and they're mature and there's not enough respect and uh, you just get like silly games. So uh, what like do people not respect? I mean, I know there are some coaches that are attempted coaches in, in NA and EU. Do people not respect these people because they're not pro gamers or like why is it hard to find someone that like, stands on the side and tells you what's good in drafting, who's like looking up all the VODs and studying other regions. Like, why is it hard to respect okay. that person? Well, so I'm a pro player. I believe I am the best pro player in NA. Why do I listen to what you say? You're not a pro player. You just watch games. I mean, this is not my perspective. This is, I'm just kind of, yeah, no, sure. like, <laughs> this is the feeling like I'm trying to play the bad guy. Like, this right. is the actual player who's actively hard to coach. And this is typical of a lot of NA players is like, why do I listen to you? Because NA doesn't have that like built in. We need to listen to a coach like mentality. Well, it, culturally, yeah, that doesn't exist. And the other thing is, is like we don't necessarily have coaches that have like backgrounds working in other esports, right? We don't have these people that have done this. 
a lot of the coaches are people that are passionate about the game. A lot of these managers are people that want to be involved in the community, but they don't, again, they're not necessarily like super experienced either. So while we have a lot of these startup teams and startup players, it's a similar situation there. Like I've been around the esports industry for a long time. Like Wolf was saying, I used to be at all of the MLG events. I worked as a tournament admin with MLG when StarCraft was at its peak. And this was when StarCraft was exploding and everybody was getting sponsored and this was becoming a big thing and Koreans are getting flown in. And I'll tell you that the the the, the interactions between the players and their, their organizations and their managers and coaches was the polar opposite of what I tend to see in Heroes. Um, whereas like they are very highly respected and resourceful and catering to their players. And I'm not saying that our managers don't do that, but it's the way that the players tend to reciprocate. And it's not like that they're mean. It's not like they're, they're, they're rude. It's just, they don't tend to seem to like, you know, look to that as like, again, like a, like a form of authority. Right. And as you mentioned, the sponsors aren't there. Well, that authority doesn't really exist right now. But even when it did, like, I mean, Juicy J was great. Uh, and and Zo Zoya was great for a long time. But I don't know if there was anyone else that really seemed to have that kind of like position of like, boom, that's that's Tempo Storm's authority. Oh, like, yeah, sure. I mean, even for Zoya, like he kind of got like slowly pushed out of that role. You know what I mean? And like alienated from being that's his true. like authoritative coaching position and that's what a lot of that drama was about specifically surrounding him so oh, yeah i mean everybody's experienced it it's like in the in the korean organizations also aren't the coaches like isn't there a lot of more money that's like put into the organization so, from like winnings and stuff right so like uh let's talk about like the big coaches in korea for a second um there's the mvp black coach he is, or you know, now just the total MVP coach. He does Miracle and Black. Hmm. He's an ex StarCraft coach. He's the old StarTail coach. For those of you guys who don't know, like he actually used to coach StarTail, and before that was involved quite heavily in uh, Zenex, which was like just a clan that became a team. So he has all this history, but he's not a pro gamer. Um, he played like StarCraft too, like a high level. He played I think Brewer at a high level as well, but he's not a pro gamer. Never was. Just a guy who got involved in MVP because um, he was you know kind of brought on by the big head. MVP coach who like is now more involved in Dota, I'd say more than anything else. Um, who also like built the LOL team gets brought in. The players respect him. There's Jitset was uh, the second most famous coach. He was a coach of uh, Hero. I don't know if you guys remember the team Hero no longer exists in Korea, but Jitset was an ex Brewer pro, but not really a, a top tier mobile player. And he wasn't even like a good Brewer player. Like he wasn't famous. He was not like winning championships. He was just like I don't know mid tier or or even below like mediocre Brewer player. Um, then there was Kino, who was the coach of TNL. Kino was a uh, support player for for Snake, um, the org that, that old Chinese org that existed back in the day, and uh, O Prime, who's like just like a mid tier GM Korea player who is uh, is a caster, like uh, on the side, like he casts like the Chinese tournaments in Korean and stuff. These are the people that like coach. These are not like, you know, I was a champion and then I like got all this respect, but then I retired and then you should respect me. These people just like know enough about the game that the players who are much younger than them respect them because they're older. This is a Korean cultural thing. So they like yeah. look up these these older people um, and then they like have some experience. But when I asked the players, like, how does O Prime coach you? Like, how does the MVP Black coach? It's like, well, he gives us a concept. Like he says, why don't we draft towards this in this game? And then he asked the players, like the shot caller on the team, to make the calls in draft. He doesn't tell them what to draft, but he says, like, let's go for this concept. And you can, like, veto stuff. Obviously, you can say, like, okay, well, I think we're actually going on the wrong path. I don't think so. Or, like, don't do that. And the players will listen to him. But the, the coaches don't, like, sit back over the clipboard and say, all right, this is it. This It's not like Loco Doco in the booth. Like, all right, this is, like, we need this <laughs> one and this one. The players just, like, listen to what he says and you know, get upset or whatever. Um, there's just, like, influence by the coach, but... It's not like directly the coach is doing all the drafts or telling the players what they do. The coach is like a manager who makes sure the players eat and get sleep and tells them when they have to play and what they have to play and what they need to focus on. The players listen to that, but they're not like the guys that are like the brains behind the team that make all the drafts. Like the players do that themselves, but yeah. they take care of the players. They tell them what to focus on. They tell them what their weaknesses are, and I think that's like super important. Um, and I think that's something that the West needs like very soon if they ever want to compete with Asia. I think in most cases, in terms of like, pr like providing more stability, that could help. 
I don't know if that's the only variable as to why we have rosters explode. I think the infrequency of events is part of that also. Um, where it's like there's no, I mean, you look at Dota. Dota also has infrequent events. Guess what happened after TI? All the teams are exploding. Like, uh, one of, I mean, the guy, his name is Ryan. He, he creates the logo for like Bloodlust and Arcane 8. He's basically, he's big into Dota. He writes for Esports Express and he's loving it right now going through the roster apocalypse of that game. So that's not ne- necessarily something that's unique to heroes. Um, but, you know, Korea does seem to be benefiting from it quite a bit, you know, having more stability on their side, even with MVP Black, you know, taking a break and coming back. And, you know, even with adjustments, they look, well, they're they're sitting in a top spot right now. Definitely. So, like, is there any way, like, foreseeable uh, in the future where some of the top NA teams, like the teams going to BlizzCon, could pick up coaches before then? Like, is that is that, like, kind of crazy to think about, or is that, like, feasible? Well, I... There are coaches, and I, I think I think like like Neventic and Gale Force are probably the ones that are in the situation where they're like more organized and they have a more of a defined structure, based on what I can tell, and that's why they're like looking as like the teams to go up next for the for that last spot. So I don't even know if they need to make changes personally. Those teams, but the other teams that are like trying to to break break in more. Like maybe denial does need a, a a coach or something or like a like a figurehead. I don't know if they have one. Yeah, I mean they put so much. Uh, I mean it, it's a real sponsor, right? I think it's a big investment in yeah. this team that kind of bombed out. To be like honest, at the last regional, like I think I was actually rooting for them. I thought they were going to go all the way. I thought they were going to be in the finals, probably versus Navantic, but it just didn't happen. Oh, not even close. Um, yeah, I, it was it was a bad bad performance, obviously, but I think. I just really wish there was some way to create further cohesion for these teams because my biggest concern was like denial was like, oh, never mind. And like they were going to split up. And I'm like, no, please just like stay together. I don't know what's going to happen if they don't qualify for BlizzCon, but I would hope that they stay together until like season one, 2017 and take this time off to like really pound out like drafts, the meta and be ready because Heroes is going to get bigger. Like it's all, is it going to be like lol big? Like, I don't know. Probably not. I mean, not not anytime soon. But it's it's getting bigger. It's going to grow. BlizzCon's going to have huge viewership. You want to be there. This is like the most important time right now because BlizzCon has the most viewership. You have the most sponsorship opportunities. You're going to make a lot of money. Now is the time to like start doing this um, and like running out of time. But I want to see like this coach like hold the teams together. Hopefully, we go to BlizzCon. If you fail, keep the team together for the next uh, split. You know, yeah. like maybe winter season or, or whatever they call it, spring season next year. I think I think it's like super important. No, keep for the big team together teams. for bloodlust. God, that's way more important. Yeah, bloodlust. Yeah, and the new online <laughs> tournaments that might happen that Blizzard is uh, kind of like talking about. We don't really know exactly what that is yet. At least I don't. So, <laughs> but there, there are going to be other tournaments, right? Like after BlizzCon, like that's what Blizzard said. So another reason yeah. to stay together. Yeah, they did say that. Mm. I think Sam tweeted that out. Um, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, kind of the state of that. Um, but you look at some of the other situations and teams that have swapped have seen mega success. Like Murloc Geniuses, they're not like necessarily the old squad. That was a, the team of players that have played together. Um, they they happen to have a lot of harmony, especially going into that patch. And, you know, they won. It was a good series, but like they won. <laughs> and they're going to BlizzCon. Yep. And... You know, I, I got to give a lot of credit to everyone there. They don't have that big brand over them, but everyone seems to respect each other a lot. There's, it's a, it's a very well mannered team. They, they all seem to just genuinely love the game, and I think that counts for a lot. Um, since I'm here and we're still like on the Korea discussion like thing down below, um, I wanted to talk to you guys about drafts really quick. Yeah, uh, good. from Korea because we're kind of just talking about like teams and coaches and stuff. <laughs> uh. What do you guys think about the changes to Tyrael and Greymane? Because he, for like a day in Korea, was like not in the drafts at all. Now he's like totally back and is, um, you know, considered to be still top tier with with Tyrael. Uh, what is NA thinking about that? Like in comparison, like what does North America think about the changes that the nerf to Greymane, the nerf to Tyrael, uh, right now? I mean, I think everyone pretty much agrees Tyrael didn't get nerfed meaningfully. If anything, like he's pretty much just as good as before, I feel like. And the gray main changes are different, but I don't I don't know if he even is much worse than he was before. So you guys don't think it's like that big? Because in Korea everyone's talking about like he was 
he's dead, it's over, and Rayman? then he came back. Yeah. Oh, our first impressions were absolutely, it's dead, he's o- he's over, it's dead. Like, goodbye, Grey Main, welcome to the dumpster. And then it's like, three games later, you're like, oh, it's so wait. <laughs> yeah. But, but Tyrael, so, Tyrael was never out of our, our minds, yeah. I don't think. Um, And uh, I wanted to ask you guys about Tyrael specifically in general, because he went like super high up in priority in some of these last big tournaments. Um, so I was even like in first band. Uh, I feel like in Asia, uh, it's like you only draft Tyrael if you have like a Greymane or a Sonya, although Sonya is not in the meta right now, or a Thrall that works well with him. But I find that in other regions, they kind of just feel like he's good no matter what, even if you don't have like a big bruiser. And for me, like I, this is always a thing I when I watch, uh, you know, foreign tournaments, like non-Korean mm-hmm. tournaments, I always wonder why that is. Is it just because like he gives him vulnerability and keeps everyone alive and you don't necessarily need him for that melee? Because in Korea... Every now and then you see him where it's like a Kale Thos draft with like, a, you know, a Falstad and there's still Tyrael there and he keeps them alive, but it feels like much worse and it doesn't usually yeah. work out. But in NA and in Europe, this does work out. So I kind of want to pick you guys' brands of why you guys think of this. Because for me, I always look at it like, oh, I don't think this is good, but people are still doing it a lot outside of Korea. Personally, I think that NA... Okay, so I don't know about NA because... You see his value oscillate a lot depending on just like what team it is and like how good their tail player is and yada yada yada. But in yeah. EU, he's like just pretty much widely considered like the best first pick if he's up. Pretty much most of the teams will just snap first pick him. They just think he's insane. And I think that's because in the double tank meta, he's like just probably the best secondary tank. Like he is an amazing like tank support hybrid and he enables pretty much every strategy and makes it so your enemies can't play a lot of strategies and i think he's just like insane it's i think you made a draft mistake if you end up in one of those compositions that you're talking about where you end up with like the false head kt tyrael like solo tank like that means you made a mistake in draft like you have plenty of room to maneuver into a draft where tyrael is just insane because i think he's just good in like 75 percent of the possible compositions you can make yeah tyrael has good talent options at pretty much every tier like borderline overpowered options across the board. I think that's what makes him so good. It's just like, it feels like it's just nonstop power spikes with him at every level. And once they made that, like uh, even in death ability and like how much damage that actually does, it can be even hard to like choose to focus and finish off a Tyrael in a fight as being any value to you. Cause you're going to like probably lose one of your DPS in the, uh, in the trade. So yeah, I think like right now Tyrael is just exceptionally strong but Dunk really hit the nail on the head with the fact that <laughs> um, in NA, it's like different players and different teams are considered to be like much better or much worse with Tyrael. So you have a team like Neventic, where I feel like they're just never going to shy away from Tyrael. And then you have a lot of other teams that are just like, eh, it's not really our thing. You know, like Tyrael, uh, double melee comps, um, all that stuff. They're, they just shy away from it. So yeah. it, it kind of depends like... In NA, it's like you have your you have your people you have your teams who follow almost like Korean draft, where that's kind of what I see of like a team like Neventic, where they really respect and, and want to make sure that they're running what they feel like is best in the world. So they're gonna follow what Korea drafts and try to learn and like adapt with that style. So, so you know, somebody like Zune is always gonna be pushing his team to like pick those comps. So I feel like they're always gonna be running Tyrael while he's at a, a power spike. Um, I agree that you can't run Tyrael very effectively with backline comps. I think that's absolutely a mistake. But I think Tyrael by himself is is the pound for pound best character to have on a team. So right I, I I really like agree with both of what you guys are saying. Um, especially what, what Dunk was saying about how like basically first pick him, you can draft around him no matter what. I think this is kind of where Tassador was at for a while. It's like, okay, you pick Tassador, there's like yeah. a million different things you can build with this, so he's just so powerful to pick early. Um I just find that like this mistake in draft that you mentioned where like the, you only have the foul side and the kill thoughts like happens so often that it, it, like, <laughs> like I like if I had like a dollar for every time I see a draft where there's like not a great hero that gets empowered by sanctification, I'd be like so rich yeah. I'd just retire. But um so is there is there any merit to that kind of, is having him in a comp like that? Like when instead of having a different tank in, in general? Well I think you're talking about like they, you don't necessarily need a bruiser. You just run another tank with him, and that that can work as well. As long as you have basically like two melee to go in, um, you can run it with the the Arthas or the ETC. These are you know picks that we see very commonly with Tyrael. 
Uh, you don't necessarily need the super high threat bruiser as much as you just need like these two people to go in together and be high threat on the back line and move your team forward. So even, I think t can work pretty good with the double tank too. Even a Tychus, I feel like, is amazing with Tyrael. Mm. Like, he does so much damage output if he just gets to auto attack for like one and a half seconds. That's all it takes. He'll absolutely eliminate a tank. And like, you see EU running Tychus 24-7. And the Tyrael synergy is insane. It's way better than having like another random range damage with your Tyrael because he actually wants to get in there and he can survive long enough to get the sank off. So like there's so much synergy there and we haven't seen that much Tychus in Korea and pretty much none with Tyrael. I'm looking at the most recent drafts and like we just don't see any Tychus and we see very little double think even like I'm looking at some compositions where like MVP Miracle was playing and there's like a tacit arterial Uther composition and like yeah you're trying to enable a Sonya Grey main in this game Tempo Storm just get like lost this game though against MVP Miracle because like you are ha- like I hate playing Uther Tass together and you add Tyrael and like this comp has like no CC and it's just an example of like how is this comp catching your opponents and actually killing them like why is your opponent going to fight you here and it seems like just not proper utilization of drafting material. That was actually um, that game on Infernal Shrines. I think that's the one you're looking at, right? That yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. That was one of my favorite drafts of of the entire season by Miracle because they just yeah. baited into this comp and they forced mm-hmm. them as a comp. They're so good at fighting, and then they went like Tychus and Rainer and just kind of like avoided it. They had Arthur's mm-hmm. too, which is like a great counter material. So that, that was like really smart drafting. I'm surprised that after that happened, we don't see that much of that type of drafting in Korea right now. Yeah. But maybe trying to hide stuff for semis because group stage for all these top four teams is basically just like a walk over the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like Tyrael, one of the strengths of Tyrael is like heroes that have lifesteal um, or, you know, yeah. like a, like self-sustainability, like Thrall, for example, uh, Sonya, because while they're invulnerable, they get their health back up so they heal themselves so the healer can focus yep. on someone else and don't necessarily have to, to burst that healing down. Um, what do you guys think about uh, auto attack Falstad? Because I feel like that is going to be a thing. Like the the more heroes develops, I think auto attack file set is going to be a thing because people will start splitting better versus his, his hammering and stuff. Um, I think auto attack file set could be super good with Tyrael because if you have secret weapon and he's just invulnerable, I mean you're in close range, but you're under the sanctification. You're just like auto attacking people super fast, especially if you get to twenty, you get Nexus Frenzy, like you heal yourself up. Um, what do you guys think about first of all, like that pairing with Tyrael and auto attack file set in, in general? As I've been saying for a while, I think like auto attack Falston could be the way to go eventually. As That's the an game interesting progresses. thought. I haven't. I guess I haven't given that much thought to like that particular synergy. Um, but I see what you're. I see the point you're making because it just lets him sit there and nonstop auto, and those autos hit so hard later in the game. Um, as far as I remember from when I would run auto attack Falstad, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he has some awkward talent here when you're running auto attack build, right? Like. I, I forget yeah. what it is. Like I think it's like level seven and and like thirteen. There's just some weird tiers where it's like he doesn't seem like he has the best synergy sometimes when you're running auto attack style. Um, well, um, at seven you get secret weapon, which I think is like insanely powerful because they you know oh they, yeah, yeah you just sit there and like just wail for extra damage while the hammering's out and it's gonna be out for longer. Um, I think the weird one is like 16. I'm not really sure what you yeah. get with that. Like you get escapability, I guess, or something. You get like faster barrels. You can move around away from people. Like if you don't get hit, you're like moving really fast. You can chase targets down. But once you get hit, you lose your um, tail spin or whatever his uh, trade is called. Tailwind. Yeah, 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 I definitely. Yeah, seven is like a crucial one. I didn't mean. I didn't mean to. Uh, yeah, 16 is a really weird one. Like 13, you get giant killer. Like almost without exception, there's like almost no way you would not do that with auto attack. But yeah. yeah, 16 is definitely awkward. 13 is, like, Giant Killer, if you don't have, like, a super tanky comp against you, can be less powerful, but I still think it's absolutely worth taking. Um, but what do you guys think about that? Because, I, I mean, I think one of the reasons why Mage Falsa is so strong right now is because people can't dodge his Q. Like, people just are not dodging it. I see at level 1, how many times I have to watch a Falsa fly across and the Q hits, like, yeah. five people? I'm yeah. like, <laughs> how many times am I going to watch this happen? Like... Yeah. Finally, people are starting to outplay it in Korea, and I think uh, outside of Korea, people are going to do it too. But I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> I, I feel like if you miss that cue, though, like auto attack Falsa is just better overall, and people are not dodging it. So I just want to hear what other people think about this because I've talked to a lot of people about this in Korea. Never really been able to talk to anyone outside of Korea about it. I think Mage Stat is is just in a really good spot. 
So while I, I see like you could definitely get some value if you have your bird stand in the sanct and just, you know, rail down the enemy front line, um, seems like it could actually be pretty darn good when you, especially versus these multiple melee type comps where there's a lot of targets for you to guaranteed hit. But Mage Shed right now does such good damage and burst onto the back line. That's where I feel like it's it's hard to argue the value because with auto attack Valside, you don't get nearly as much just threat and poke onto like Zigaras and, and Rhaegars and all these other characters that are kind of mid range. When you throw that Q out and you pop your boomerang and you get that like 40% chunk on two people, you're just like, holy, that's Falstad right there, you know? So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely in a bursty meta. I mean, we kind of always have been. Like, if, you don't, if you're if you a sustained damage dealer, you don't do as much for your team as uh, obviously the burst that uh, Kael'thas used to put out, Jaina used to put out, um, now Falstad. And like Lunara, for example, not as popular because she doesn't have that burst. She has sustained damage. Um, but she has a, a better range and better safety, I guess you could say. Um, okay, well, just uh, this is kind of like what I well, there's, was. Well, there's the auto attack this. build. It's an interesting thing to bring up. I mean, I, I definitely. Oh my gosh, like, <laughs> I think it's a it's a really interesting thing to bring up, and uh, you know, seeing more variety in, in foul side builds is something I feel like could come, especially with Tyrael working along with it, um, just kind of like Tychus. But we also might see more W builds with the uh, the bribe. That that could also be a thing that I starts so. to pop up a little bit more. That's why I like the talent so much, just because like W build has never really been a thing, or at least no, has it ever? Not consistently. No. But like, no. I mean, no, you just... there have been times where you take one or two W talents, and you even do now. You still take Static Shield on Hammer, unlike Hammer False Dad. But it's just like such an inconsistent ability. I feel like mm, I true. I think you give up too much Wave Clear if you don't go Q build False Dad like. He he gets so much wave clear from boomerang Don't, at seven. Just get that... hit on his blast. You're good. <laughs> Still 120 <laughs> seconds. Get hit on his blast that wave, man. It's no problem. <laughs> hey, man. If it was 60 second cooldown, definitely. I precision strike waves all day from across <laughs> the map. But anyone's no, thank you. <laughs> um, it's a buff, man. When is that coming back? <laughs> I miss yeah. it. I actually do. I always thought it was fun Good to watch times. the wind up and then to see if it would get the kill or mm-hmm. not. It was always really, mm-hmm. you know, that anticipation is really fun. But. Yeah. Um. So just like uh, closing thoughts on Korea, like they're gonna win BlizzCon if they if the groups don't Damn. if the groups don't uh don't uh, like mess with them. Like it'll probably be Korea versus Korea finals unless like they have to hit each other in the semis. I want to make this prediction now. So the boldest prediction ever uh, that that Korea is gonna win it. Um. I think China actually this season is weaker than they were last season. So yeah. I think that if if Korea hits Korea before the finals, like we could have a non-Asian team in the finals, which would be really exciting, just like Cloud9 uh, last time. So pretty pretty excited for that possibility. Um, but I, I think Korea is going to win the tournament. They're, the teams that we have right now are like the ones that are going to go to BlizzCon have been together for so long now, and these players have played together for so long. Like Even if Miracle goes, even though it's a newer team, these players have played together so much, and they've you know known each other since the alpha. Actually, a lot of team players on Miracle used to play together on teams like in the alpha when they were like super small level uh, heroes tournaments going on, like Tist, for example. These guys have been playing for so long, so good right now that like I just can't imagine the rest of the world like can stand up to them. Like, is, do you guys want to like make a compelling argument? Is everyone just going to say well, like, okay, here's what I would say: is that I I think you're probably like generally correct on that, but what I want to wait to see is packs because. If one of the, if like, for example, if GFE, like their roster after these, the fan change is like pretty stacked, Mm -hmm. probably it's getting close to as stacked as you can get in Mm -hmm. NA. And um, if they can like, if they come out of this tournament just looking like a super team, then I might give them a little bit of chance versus Korean teams. But I feel like if we see packs and all the NA teams stack very evenly up against each other, I'm, I'm a hundred percent with you on that. Also with this PTR, like we don't know how the meta is going to go. If the meta suddenly becomes yeah. less team fight dependent, becomes more about rotations and like push potential and cheeky strats that enable, you know, cough and luck to go to town on Zagara, where suddenly it's harder to, to draft against uh, Murlocs because they have all these crazy things at their disposal. That's going to throw like even more wrenches in the, the cog wheels, if you will. Somebody is shooting a gun outside and it's scaring me. Oh I've heard like, I, I don't know <laughs> if it's, it sounds like a gun. I don't like it. Anyways, heard that last one, that last one was, it's it like, came right it's through, like man. getting closer seemingly. And I, 
I, it's fine. Rainer's just queuing <laughs> some minion waves. It's fine. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see. I, I still agree with you. Uh, Korea is definitely I, I think, number I think one, the, right? the point you make, though, about the, the PTR changes is like a really good one. I think it's going to hurt China the most, to be honest, because like all they do is team fight and they're like, okay, we killed somebody. Now we all five go to every camp on the map and that's the, that's Chinese rotations. Is like five people rotate around the map together and take everything, all the resources, then split back to lanes. I think it'll hurt Tempo Storm's play style as well, but like I think Miracle, L5, and Black are like, it's going to make them even stronger because they're so strong at rotations. Their team fighting is good too, but it's not like that's how they win everything. It's They win team fights because they rotate better and get picks and then win 5v4s and stuff like that. Whereas like Tempo Storm, especially at, at the um, the uh, summer championship, I always forget what season it is. Like they won the tournament off of team fighting alone. Like mm-hmm. they won the tournament off winning like three v fives because their team fights were like so damn good and their sanks were so on point. So I think it's going to hurt them and their roaming and and uh, you know they have to change their play, play style going forward. I think a lot of teams are going to have to change their play style, um, but. We'll have to see as time unfolds. BlizzCon obviously is going to be very exciting. Wolf, the final question I have for you for Korea. You said it's True. not going to be Tempo Storm going into the that that finals. You think it's you truly? How how confident are you? It's going to be double MVP going to BlizzCon. Insanely, like I think if it's not double MVP, it's L five that goes in with uh, with Black. Um, like you just can't deny this team has been playing together in this exact roster since the beginning of the year. Um, since OGN season two, basically, um, they were like, since this season where they lost to DK in the finals, the first OGN season, which was the sickest, uh, OGN season, I think it was like the most hype. Cause everyone was like really behind heroes at that moment. Right. Uh, they had everyone except lockdown in the finals. So like this team has been a four man together for going on a year now. Uh, and the the fifth player they brought is like the highest level player in the world, like highest rated and stuff on Hot Sog, I guess. Um, and now they have this team that's been together for so long. Like Black is going. They almost won the finals. People underestimate them because they lost to Tempest Storm. Like, well, or Tempest back then. Like, well, I mean, they lost by one game. It was a, um, yeah, it was a good series. And they are like going for sure, um, for sure. L five did make the match against them look like competitive. But I think that Black was also kind of trying to hide some of their their strategies. Mm. They also have Miracle, which they only scrim each other, so they've kind of like monopolized their talent as well in that way. Like the only time you're ever going to scrim against Black is if you hit like Rich in the solo queue, and he'll probably still beat you anyways. Um, so I'm like very confident in this prediction. I'm hoping for an upset, to be honest, because two of the same org teams going representing BlizzCon that's like, kind of weird. Um, like yeah. we saw like. Samsung do this, which uh, you know, in League of Legends, for example, this is like this happened before. Um, but I think it's kind of weird and strange. Yeah. And I would love to see like rewards for new sponsors like Tempo Storm. I want to see L5 get an actual sponsor. Like I'm hoping for things like this to happen because MVP is not going to go away if both of their teams don't go to BlizzCon. So I'm very confident they both will right now. But if they don't, I'm happier. If that makes sense. Okay. Well, I guess we'll have to find tempo, out. Man. When when do the playoffs? Oh, they, <laughs> they end in like two days, right? So on uh, there's actually like a break this time, so there's no match on Thursday, oh. but on uh, yeah, I'm like looking at the calendar right now. It's Sunday that uh, L5 plays us uh, against First Family. Probably going to be really one sided, but we'll see. First Family looked better to, uh, last night than they did last time they played, so. L5 did three of them easily, and I think they probably will again. And that's going to put L5 against Miracle and then Tempo Storm against Black. So then you'll have that um, Miracle versus Black uh, winner's finals, because in Korea we also have double elimination for semis. Mm-hmm. So well, there's like a, a lot of crazy awesome matches coming up. Not, I'm actually not even going to be casting all of it, because uh, StarCraft finals are coming up, early finals, um, cross no finals, stuff like that. So I'll be, like, G-Cup will be filling in for me for some of those, but... Uh, uh, I'm super hyped about the matches coming up, so I'm definitely think that the MVP versus MVP match will be like you just can't miss it. More people need to watch OGN. Why don't enough people watch? It? It's in the middle of the night, but I'm not getting up <laughs> at 3 a.m., man. You gotta wake up at 3 a.m. You have to do it. I watch the mods. So, it's it's Twitch.tv slash OGN Global, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
follow that channel, watch it. You guys, not enough people are watching that. You guys are messing up. Um, Step it up. I mean, I don't care if people watch or not because I have passion and like I know these teams are going to go to BlizzCon and I'll. Dude, I'll what was it, what was up with the like Hammer Chogall, Ariel like? Wh- where that did was that come from? That did that right? Like I'm did, trying to remember. Yeah, that. didn't it work? I um, mean, the both teams had troll drafts, so one of them worked. Um, <laughs> yeah, Tempo Storm boom. Won. Tempo Storm was boom. Yeah, I think that was boom doing fan service with the Sergeant Hammer pick. Okay. And, okay. Uh, um, the Ariel. The Ariel was like a little bit of fan service with Chogall as well. Wait, wait. Uh, Ariel Chogall wait, though that's is real. pretty insane. That's a real right? thing. All right. Like they were losing the game until the end because they just have better team fighting and better synergy, but they were like losing the game really hard for the majority of it as well. Like if you go so, back and watch the VOD. Do you not think Ariel is good? Me? Yeah. I think Ariel is overrated. I think she is very good. Overrated. Though. Yeah. Like I think she's like. You know when before, if Uther or Rhaegar was banned and you had to take Karzim, I think she's like in that slot right now where it's like, I mean, obviously she's not going to be drafted that way, but I think like that's kind of where I list her in supports. Hmm. It's kind of like okay. third, third tier, like third string. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she's cool with double support. And I think if you put her with certain heroes, like she builds hope so quickly that she can be really powerful. Like I think she pairs really well with Lunara. And we saw that yesterday because... Constant damage all the time. Like your hope is off the charts. Um, hope is off her, the charts. Hope's off the yeah. charts, man. Uh, then you get her if she get to sixteen, she gets the ability power buff as well. You put that on somebody like that's really strong. Um, I think her stun is crazy good, and uh, people are going to get better at hitting that once people understand it better. Um, is she ever going to be as good as Rhaegar? Not unless they keep ra- nerfing Rhaegar. <laughs> so uh, I think she's it good though. Got nerfed again. Yeah, that's true. Uh, mostly because of the movement changes, though, I guess. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, I don't think Ariel is bad, and I think that we're going to see her a lot more going forward just because the way her trait works is powerful, and she does a lot of damage. She has wave clear. And I think she's going to be really good in lane uh, once the new changes happen as well for the movement speed reduction. Mm. But yeah, that's uh, that's kind of my closing thoughts on that. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. unfortunately, we are mostly out of time, so I'm just going to give everyone a bit of a update here on Bloodlust, some of the the big contributors coming through. For whatever reason, our, our European friends seem to really want to support Bloodlust, and I, I have to thank them all personally. But actually, this week we were about to hit seven thousand. Snitch donated nearly a hundred dollars to oh hit us to gosh. hit us, well, bring us to seven thousand. Then Dark Mock swings in and brings us to seventy five hundred, unlocking Town Holiday or Town Lolliday. Town Lolliday is a stretch goal where we're going to be doing a a brew episode featuring Kubi, Zoya, myself, Dunk, and more. We'll announce more people with that. It's going to be a bit of a chaotic special episode. Uh, so that's been unlocked. Thank you guys so much for that. Then Bakery. I feel like the EU people are hoping for like a stretch goal to come out where you fly the EU teams in. Oh, like that's right. <laughs> But yeah, we're getting there. Bakery <laughs> couldn't allow Dark Mock to donate more than him, so now he brought himself up to 501. And uh, just before the show, Hasu Obs actually donated as well. So thank you guys so much. The prize pool is at $7,844. And that's just insane. Like, I, there's just no other way to put it. So. Uh, obviously the event is, is well underway with its planning. I'm still figuring stuff out. Dunk, KO, myself, Zoya, we'll all be casting the event, flying in those three guys, um, which I really need to figure out. (laughs) Um, and then (laughs) the other thing that is, that happened since last week is I launched a Teespring campaign. I don't remember if that was before or after last week's show, um, but there is now an official Bloodlust shirt that you can get. It's uh, teespring.com slash bloodlust underscore GG. The shirt looks like this. You got the little Bloodlust logo. Uh, you can get it on the back. It has the Arcanate logo. That's the brand. Some people are like, what is that logo? I'm like, well, that's my new esports company, man. Like, That's a sexy logo, by the way. You like Whoever made that, man, deserves top dollar. That looks so sick. I'm a big fan. Thanks, dude. Yeah, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of elements I like about it that I'm not going to talk about because we are short on time. Uh, lots of fancy colors. You name it. And then there's a hoodie version. Um, so... There is a, a separate Europe campaign. I think if you go to it and you want to buy it from Europe, I set it up so it has a separate campaign so that shipping is supposedly cheaper. That's what Teespring told me. So I was like, cool, I'll do this, yeah. Um, 
and sweet. So that's what's going on so with awesome. Bloodlust. Registration is well underway. I think it's more than half full already. Um, it's, of course, the the link for that is on arcane8.com. The sign up is right at the top of the page. Let me just double check to see how many teams have signed up. 18 teams. And right now we're capping it at 32. We potentially will expand that to 64. Uh, but we'll have to figure that out when we get there because the opening, the open bracket will be on the 10th and 11th of September. So the week after PAX, about a week and a half from now. And then the main event uh, where top four from that event will advance, will be joined by top four from PAX and be playing for the prize pool. But huh, ramble complete. Um, so I just want to say this is like a super awesome project. And like, I'm really glad you're doing this because this is like what the scene needs. And I think this also proves um, in a way that like if there were if Blizzard had officially like sanctioned tournaments that were like prize pools were given by fans or based on percentages of people buying things, you know, like skins and stuff, this really works. I mean, this is like literal proof that this works. So I I, I think this is like an awesome project that could lead to like huge things in the future. Um, when I heard about this, I was like super stoked because this is like what the rest of the world needs because they don't have regular tournaments i know i'm just kind of like beating a dead horse here by like saying like oh this is awesome like yeah this is cool. <laughs> uh, like uh this is like super important right like stuff like this happening because this doesn't happen in heroes because sponsors don't fund tournaments this is just not a thing but if the community funds it then it grows then it looks bigger then sponsors want to make things happen the blizzard wants to have you know donations for blizzcon prize pool and then everything gets better so just want to have that little like rant there because I think this is like you guys should donate to this. It's super important uh, for North America specifically right now. Well, thanks, man. And I, I, you know, maybe I'll do it for Europe next. I don't know because the Europeans seem to really like the idea too. So, uh, but yeah, it seemed I'm just I can't believe the the response from the community. And like you said, you know, maybe eventually in game would be a thing. We've obviously talked about that a lot on the show in the past. We've seen what Dota can do. There's obviously pros and cons. Um, who knows? Who knows? Time will tell. But uh, normally I'd like to extend the show. But I've got a pack because I've got an early flight. So we are going to transition to the shout outs. But just right off the bat, Wolf, thank you so much for joining us early in the morning over in Asia land. It's been a, it's been Thanks a for having pleasure me, having man. you, dude. Yeah, it's been great. I, I don't get to actually get to talk to like North American people that often um you know on like shows and stuff like this or interact with the commentators because i don't you know i don't comment commentate na uh i live across the ocean and stuff so to have, be able to have this discussion is is super cool and uh, i'd love to talk to you guys more often so have me on again please sometime <laughs> of course man and uh where can everyone find you um just hit me up on proxy wolf on twitter i'd love to to hear what you guys think um about me going on the show and my commentary in general and uh Watch OGN Global on Twitch. I mean, I don't really stream that often. I do sometimes, but really watching OGN is the best way to kind of support my scene and what I do out here. So I definitely recommend doing that. You can also watch my, my StarCraft stuff I do. Uh, I cast Pro League. I cast uh, Star League. I cast GSL. Sometimes I cast the StarCraft 1 Star League. So I do a lot of stuff out here in Korea. If you want to be, like, in touch with what's happening out here, I tweet about basically every game, like, from Overwatch to Heroes to StarCraft uh, and, and, and even League and dota and what's happening there so i'm like the guy to follow to find out what's happening um on this side of the world very cool and uh all righty ko yeah and uh just want to say yeah wolf that was awesome it was cool to just exchange thoughts about stuff and it's it's interesting to hear that perspective where you actually are in the middle of it and know everything that's going on so very cool and uh if you guys want to find me you can follow me on twitch ko youtube.com slash ko of course, with the big tournament coming up with the uh, the PAX tournament, I'll have a lot of uh, cool content to make a little analysis, deep dive stuff on different strats and choices that are made by the teams during the tournament. So if you want to see some more in-depth look at the st strategical side of things, definitely uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. But that's about it for me. Laura Dunk, Master of the awesome. Grind. Will you hit 110 tonight? That's the plan, Jake. Um... But more importantly, thanks to Wolf and Ko again for being on the show. It's good times. Um, yeah, I actually really can't wait to see who makes it out of PAX. And we'll get to meet up against the Korean overlords at BlizzCon. I'm looking forward to it. Well, guys, the PAX is 
only days away. That'll be happening on Friday this week. Uh, the reason the show was on Tuesday is because, well, I got to fly tomorrow and not going to be able to do the show there. From PAX, make sure you watch Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The event will be three days of glorious Heroes action, as Dunk mentioned. One final team from NA will be earning themselves a spot into BlizzCon, so there's a lot at stake. Immediately following that, Bloodlust Qualifier the week after. The week after that is the Bloodlust Live event. So that means for the first time in North America, we have three full weekend broadcasts. Like We've had like our one-day Heroes qualifiers, but these are two-day you know, full days of broadcasting three weeks in a row. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm really excited to, you know, just get all that out there and bring the great content to everyone and see what the teams do. Because when teams play from home, they tend to see seem a little bit more comfortable to do weird and dumb strats. If you think, if you want to go watch something weird, you want to see some strange heroes action and some terrible, terrible casting, go watch the Town Hall Heroes Invitational from last year where we did a four-man cast at the end. It's silly, but the games were great. Dunk played well. <laughs> Actually, that was both of you. That was you guys versus each other. Go Good old days. Yeah. Go watch it. Uh, that's going to do it here for us. Once again, thank you guys for coming on. And uh, I guess I'll see you at PAX. GG's.